everyone. I'm Anita Cicero, Deputy Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And today I will be your Master of Ceremonies for Event 201. On behalf of our center and our partners, the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience here in New York, as well as our larger virtual audience participating online today. The goal of the Event 201 exercise is to illustrate the potential consequences of a pandemic and the kinds of societal and economic challenges it would pose. The scenario also highlights the very critical role that global business and public-private partnerships play in preparing for and responding to pandemics. Today's scenario is going to simulate meetings of a multi-stakeholder group called the Pandemic Emergency Board. This board has been urgently convened by the World Economic Forum, and Johns Hopkins has been asked to moderate the board meetings and provide expertise during the board's deliberations. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. The board's recommendations are aimed at top decision makers in national governments, global business, and international organizations. In this scenario, Tom Inglesby, the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, will be chairing the board and serving as the moderator for its discussions. Today's exercise will simulate four meetings of the Pandemic Emergency Board, and each meeting will be devoted to one key topic. Each meeting will start with a video and a briefing that will provide the information needed for the board members to engage. Please note, this is not a test of any particular person, organization, or nation. The participants are all playing as themselves. That is, senior business executives, NGO leaders, and government officials. They're not expected to be pandemic experts. We've really asked them to participate based on their own expertise and their best professional judgment. With the exception of Tom Minglesby, none of the participants know any of the details about how the exercise will unfold. The Event 201 scenario is fictional, but it's based on public health principles, epidemiologic modeling, and assessment of past outbreaks. In other words, we've created a pandemic that could realistically occur. And for those interested in our assumptions, we will have a lot of the background research and of the scenario publicly available on our Event 201 website at the conclusion of the exercise. The policy discussions, the challenges to be discussed in this exercise represent controversial high stakes issues that would require high level input from business and government leaders. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. For our in-person audience, please do silence all your electronic devices, but you may tweet at hashtag event 201. We're going to have a 15 minute break in the middle of the exercise, so please try to confine your calls and, and work to that time. Because the event is being video recorded and live streamed, we ask that you remain quiet as much as possible and avoid moving around during the exercise. The exercise is going to end at 1230 and there'll be a luncheon in the cotillion room to which you are all invited. As you know, there's also an online virtual event 201 exercise that's happening simultaneously. And for those of you online, um, and I understand there are hundreds of you, uh, you will be seeing the same news videos and briefings as we do here in New York. But you will engage in your own online discussion in, in place of watching the discussions of the players here in the room. The topics and the of the uh, the topics and the pacing of the deliberations will be the same, both online and in the room. So as you can see on this slide, uh, we have an outstanding group of global leaders playing the role of the Pandemic Emergency Board members here in New York. And with that, let's welcome our participants and invite them into the room. Tom Inglesby from Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, Latoya Abbott, Marriott International, Sophia, Sophia Borges, UN Foundation, Brad Conant, Henry Schein, 
Chris Elias, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tim Evans, formerly of the World Bank. George Gao from China CDC. Averill Haynes, former Deputy U.S. National Security Advisor. Jane Holton, ANZ Bank, and former secretaries of both the Department of Health and Finance in Australia. Matthew Harrington from Edelman. Martin Knuckle from Lufthansa Group. Eduardo Martinez, UPS Foundation. Stephen Redd from US CDC. Adrian Thomas from Johnson & Johnson. And Hasti Taggi from NBC Universal Media. And Lavin Theroux from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Welcome. And before we begin the exercise, I also want to introduce Ryan Moorhard, who's lead of the Global Health Security Group at the World Economic Forum, and he will say a few words. Ryan. Thank you, Anita, and good morning, and welcome again on behalf of the Center for Health Security, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Economic Forum. Welcome to event 201. 201. Throughout our session today, I hope that number will represent two dimensions of our work to strengthen global health security. First, today, there are 200 epidemic events every year, and it hasn't always been this way. The number is increasing, driven by globalization, climate change, urbanization, deforestation, and other trends of our modern world. In other words, we're in a new era of epidemic risk. And the second dimension is that one of these days, one of these epidemic events will be a pandemic, a fast-moving pandemic. And mitigating risk and impact of that pandemic will require an all-hands-on-deck approach. And we know from past responses that public-private cooperation will be essential. We also know from these responses that there are some bright spots when it comes to public-private cooperation, but some real critical challenges remain. But there's every reason for us to work together to address these challenges. For one, it turns out that at $570 billion annualized, the annualized risk posed by pandemics is uh, on par and rivals with climate change, which means that the pandemic risk to lives and livelihoods is at a level that governments and the world's biggest businesses can no longer afford to ignore. And we are counting on this conversation today to inform our work together to improve our collective preparedness and to protect lives and livelihoods from pandemics. And to provide further context, I'm very pleased to introduce a short video now from Dr. Mike Ryan, the executive director at WHO and the head of WHO's emergency program. So with that, we'll turn to a video. Greetings, distinguished guests, and, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, say a few words at this year's event uh, 201, uh, the high-level simulation exercise for pandemic preparedness and response, hosted by uh, John Hopkins Center for Health Security, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to join you today. Um, I'm involved in the IHR Emergency Committee for Ebola, but I had hoped to be in the room with you because the issues you will be dealing with over the next hours uh, may be tabletop exercises today, but they address real and critical threats which we at WHO take very seriously. Without a question, epidemic risk has become a global strategic concern. I don't think we've ever been in a situation where we have had to respond to so many health emergencies at once. This is a new normal. I don't expect the frequency of these epidemics to reduce, and in fact, vulnerabilities all over the world, developed and developing countries, have increased, not decreased, driven by many, many factors, mainly uh, through human behavior, economic uh, development, uh, population density, uh, and many others. The scenario you will be presented with this morning could easily become one <clears throat> shared reality uh, one day. 
I fully expect uh, that we will be confronted by a fast-moving, highly lethal pandemic of a respiratory pathogen. The question is, are we prepared to globally respond to the next major pandemic event? Are we ready to cooperate and perform across countries and across sectors to face such a threat? Have we established the surveillance and risk assessment systems, the communication tools, the supply chains, uh, and the business continuity plans that will be needed not only to protect health in a major uh, epidemic or pandemic, but to protect uh, economic development, to protect political and social systems. Um, do we collectively uh, drive innovation enough to face the evolving global threats which we are anticipating? The nature of pandemics is that many countries will be affected at the same time. This is particularly true with the respiratory pathogen, as they are often transmitted by asymptomatic persons. They spread fast. In 2009, the pandemic virus reached all continents in less than nine weeks. WHO's priorities are to establish a minimum capacity to detect and respond in each country around the world to develop global strategies for the containment and control of individual disease threats and develop global mechanisms to ensure cross-sectoral and multinational, multilateral coordination. Innovation and partnership across all sectors are needed, including, including joint strategies between global health leaders and the drivers of travel, communication, data technology industries. WHO is working at all levels through a variety of partnerships to strengthen national and regional preparedness such as GORN, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. Through the PIP framework uh, adopted by WHO member states in 2011, WHO has secured 400 million vaccine doses uh, for influenza, 10 million antiviral treatments and 250,000 diagnostic kits for the next pandemic. We have completed external evaluations of surveillance and response systems in over 100 countries and carried out more than 50 simulation exercises at country level looking for vulnerabilities and weaknesses in national systems. This voluntary, collaborative, multi-sectoral process helps countries to assess their capacities and identifies the most critical gaps within their health systems in order to prioritise opportunities for enhanced preparedness and response. The Pandemic Supply Chain Network, uh, part of the Epidemic Readiness Accelerator, which is a, uh, a project of the World Economic Forum in partnership with many, including WHO, it's a public-private collaboration to develop a globally connected supply chain that can support health emergency operations during a pandemic. Stakeholders consist of product manufacturers to logistics providers, distributors and UN partners, including ourselves. Uh, Michael Griffin uh, is WHO's focal point for the Pandemic Supply Chain Network and he is there with you this week. Constant innovation and the use of cutting-edge technology is key to pandemic preparedness. In order to pool data and analytics at a global scale for disease prevention, the EpiBrain initiative, a global data ecosystem, aims to build a collaboration of big data networks to understand and predict epidemics. It supports data science, innovation for outbreak preparedness and response. Despite this progress, there is still much to be done. Cross-sectoral simulation exercises, such as the one you will be experiencing today, contribute to a better understanding of the critical gaps, the cooperation required from global businesses, response decisions required from government and public health leaders to minimise large-scale economic and societal consequences of a severe pandemic. I wish you the best of luck, and we are looking forward to working with each of you to strengthen pandemic preparedness in the future. Thank you. And our thanks to, to Dr. Ryan. And, and with that, here in New York and online, welcome to Event 201. It began in healthy looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care. Many died. At first, the spread was limited to those with close contacts, healthcare personnel, co-workers, and families. But now, it's spreading rapidly throughout local communities. 
International travel has turned local epidemics into a pandemic spanning the globe. Just three months ago, CAP started in South America, but has now reached several countries with more than 30,000 cases and nearly 2,000 deaths. Good morning, and thank you all for being part of this Pandemic Emergency Board. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. <clears throat> the global community has been working to respond to this pandemic since its recognition. But as health and economic impacts have become more severe, the World Economic Forum has convened this board <clears throat> because of your combined expertise, your backgrounds, and your global voice. We will need all of you to help us respond to urgent policy crises that are emerging. The purpose of this board is to advise leaders in national governments, global business, and international organizations on the response to the pandemic, particularly focused on international problems that require collaboration between business and government. Your recommendations will be critical and will be promulgated and communicated broadly at the end of this meeting. On the left screen, as we have this meeting, you will find a dashboard of information about the pandemic that will help us in our conversations. As important background for this discussion, we want to start the meeting by viewing this news story that just aired on Global News Network. Continuing our coverage of the newly discovered CAPS disease and the scope of its deadly outbreaks, there are now more than 30,000 reported cases. Experts warn this may be just the beginning of a global problem. GNN science reporters have produced a video about what we know so far about CAPS, the virus, the outbreak, and the resulting chaos. CAPS is a novel coronavirus related to those viruses that caused the frightening SARS epidemic in 2003 and the deadly MERS outbreaks in recent years. Scientists think each infected person in turn infects on average two more people. This disease is proving more transmissible than SARS or MERS and about as contagious as influenza. Essentially, the cumulative number of cases is doubling every week. At this rate, we can expect to see 16 times as many cases in a month unless we find a way to interrupt transmission. The virus appears to be spreading rapidly in densely populated and impoverished neighborhoods in some megacities in South America. CAPS is a serious respiratory disease. More than half of the recognized cases have required hospital care, creating a huge strain on healthcare systems. The fatality rate is about 10%. For comparison, CAPS is about as lethal as SARS and two to four times more lethal than the 1918 influenza pandemic, the worst pandemic on record. Even so, some people only exhibit mild flu-like symptoms, not requiring treatment in a hospital. Alarmingly, those people are able to walk around and spread the virus, not realizing they are doing so. Even worse, international travelers have been arriving at their destination symptom-free, but within a matter of hours, becoming ill. Travel-related cases have blossomed into outbreaks in a number of locations and have quickly grown faster than health authorities could respond and contain them. In other places, physicians have quickly recognized the symptoms of CAPS and have been able to isolate infected individuals and avoid an outbreak for now. Global public health experts are very concerned about this disease. Because it appears the virus is readily transmitted through the air from person to person, essentially all people are susceptible. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. Models developed by leading public health authorities indicate a CAPS pandemic could lead to an outcome worse than the 1918 influenza, which killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Given the global population is four times larger than it was in 1918, 
if these models prove accurate, we could be looking at hundreds of millions of deaths over the next year or two. Okay, now we're gonna get a briefing on the numbers and distribution of cases by Dr. Caitlin Rivers. As you've just heard, the outbreak is very worrisome. The vast majority of cases are occurring in Brazil and other South American countries. However, as you can see on the screen, there have been some spread to Portugal, the continental United States, and mainly in China. Our models project that with continued spread in Latin America and predicted spread to additional countries, we could be looking at double the number of cases in one week and 16 times as many in a month if we are not able to stop the spread. That would be on the order of half a million cases and it would continue to rise exponentially. In three months, we could be approaching 10 million cases. We are also tracking financial markets as an indicator of the economic impacts of CAPS. While markets are down worldwide in the past couple of weeks, they are still positive for the year. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. The first emerging policy crisis for which we need this board's recommendations <clears throat> regards global allocation and distribution of medical countermeasures. And by medical countermeasures, we mean vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics and other medical supplies to help us combat the CAPS pandemic. I know we would all agree that if we had a vaccine in hand for CAPS, it'd be a game changer. But leading vaccine experts say a vaccine in the near term is highly unlikely. But there is an antiviral that does look like it will work. And to understand that better, we're going to watch one more clip here. Continuing our CAPS disease coverage and possible solutions, I'm joined by immunologist Dr. Yubani Bello and Dr. Rhea Blakey, an epidemiologist, both highly respected in their fields. Let's get right to it. Why are people saying a vaccine for the CAPS virus is not likely in the near term? Researchers are working on a vaccine, and we have viable leads, but it's complicated. We have known about CAPS-like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. And sure, there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. Even if we discover a good vaccine candidate, we are starting from scratch, and it takes time to test safety and efficacy, typically years. So even if testing moves quickly, global manufacturing will still need to be established. Again, multiple hurdles. We simply cannot rely on these old timelines and processes. This is a crisis. We have to move beyond these issues. It may be complicated, difficult, but if we dedicate all available resources, this can happen. Also, keep in mind, we need effective treatments sooner rather than later. Extronavir is an antiviral drug. Scientists have told me this could be effective. We need to start treating people immediately. While I agree, Extranavir does look promising. It's currently used for treating HIV. However, it's not manufactured on the scale needed for treating this many people. And will we just stop using it for HIV treatment? How will we get this drug in the quantities needed? Who decides who has priority for the limited amounts we do have? We both know countries are hoarding Extranavir. Doctor, in my opinion, you are lost in the details. With enough money and political will, anything is possible. Let's get going on this now. Thank you both for this extremely important discussion. Our U.S. affiliate has just released polling results on public expectations for a vaccine. A majority of Americans expect a vaccine to be available within two months, and 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. In related news, a significant demand for personal protective equipment like N95 masks and gloves are on the rise due to the pandemic. However, globally, hospitals are running low. Additionally, other critical medical supplies such as saline and antibiotics are dwindling. Countries and companies are reportedly stockpiling supplies, disrupting healthcare supply chains, causing dangerous shortages in many parts of the world. And finally, for the latest information on what we know about vaccines and this antiviral, here's <clears throat> medical countermeasure expert Matt Watson. 
As we've just heard, there is no existing vaccine that appears effective against the newly discovered CAPS virus. Governments, scientists, and companies around the world have become working intensively to develop one, but it's highly unlikely that a vaccine could be developed, tested, manufactured, and distributed in less than a year, and it's likely to take much longer. While there have been efforts to develop vaccines against SARS and MERS coronaviruses, none have been licensed, and given the distinctions in the CAPS virus, vaccines against those diseases would not be effective for CAPS. The antiviral drug Extronavir has demonstrated some efficacy against the CAPS virus. It reduces the severity of illness and save, saves lives in those who are infected, but does not prevent infection like a vaccine would. Extronavir is a generic drug primarily used to treat HIV. It is manufactured in five countries, including the United States and China. Approximately one million people take Extronavir every day for HIV. If all of those HIV patients could be switched to other antiretroviral drugs, we could potentially free up enough extranovir to treat 26 million CAPS patients. Assuming further that we could double production over the course of a year by bringing additional manufacturing online, we could eventually have 52 million treatment courses per year, but it will take many months to get there. And there is not likely uh, ever to be enough to keep up with the need as long as the disease continues to spread at this accelerating rate. Experts agree that while many lives will be saved by this antiviral, there's, it is not going to slow the pandemic in the same way a vaccine uh, could if we had one available. However, we do have the potential capacity to save many people. Now the question is, how do we distribute the supplies we have? Existing global supply chains and logistics networks for Extronavir run efficiently under normal conditions, but the pandemic is likely to be very different. We are hearing that one country where Extronavir is produced is planning to block some or all of the export of this medicine to hold on to it for their own people. Tensions are rising between governments and pharmaceutical and medical supply companies about how supplies should be allocated and who gets to make those decisions. International humanitarian organizations are raising serious concerns about access to antivirals for people in low and middle income countries. In addition to antivirals, other medical supplies are not reaching those who need them in many parts of the world. This is especially pronounced in low and middle income countries, which are reporting the highest rates of disease transmission and mortality. In part, this is due to last minute stockpiling and hoarding by customers and in part, it is due to cost and logistics issues. Personal protective equipment, such as N95 respirators, are in critical, critically short supply in some areas. N95 respirators are manufactured by many countries or companies around the world, um, but there are no reliable estimates of how many, are, how many are produced or what global production surge capacity is. All we can say is that production capacity covers normal demand and it is not uncommon to have temporary shortages during severe flu seasons. In a severe pandemic, we can expect the need to increase by a factor of at least two to three. Given these supply issues, there are a number of potential proposals being floated aimed at coordinating and facilitating medical countermeasure allocation and delivery around the world. Politicians, business leaders, scientists and policymakers are weighing in. Some, some are suggesting that suppliers and buyers continue to work independently to decide where to send antivirals and medical supplies. Others are suggesting that countries where these products are made should be able to decide where those drugs and supplies go. Still others are recommending that suppliers, buyers, and countries entrust a central international entity or organization with the job of allocation and distribution decisions for at least a portion of antivirals and other medical supplies. Thank you, Mr. Watson. So the policy crisis in question for this board in this meeting is this. How should governments, business, and international organizations allocate and distribute pandemic antivirals and medical supplies to the people who need them most? We now have time for discussion about this matter. This is the focus of this meeting. Any reactions? We have too few antivirals 
for the needs that we have, and we're projecting to have increasing needs. So should we let normal suppliers and buyers manage the, manage the distribution and allocation of this medication? Should government step in? If so, with what rules? Steve? Yeah, let, me, let me start by saying um, it is um, fantastic how much has been learned about this disease in just the short period of time mm -hmm. since its discovery. Um, I think one issue that um, hasn't yet been explored is um, what could be done to uh, suppress transmission apart from the use of countermeasures. And so I think that's something that needs to be an active area of study. Learning yes. where uh, transmission is occurring would be helpful in order to implement measures that don't require um, uh, medicines to suppress transmission. Maybe uh, hospital settings, school settings, or okay. places where transmission could be occurring. Um, with regards to the question of um, sharing this uh, scarce resource, uh, we do have some models that I think could be, um, could be built upon. Um, the PIP framework, the um, things that were done during H1N1 to, uh, to share vaccine, I think each of those, uh, those models should be explored uh, as uh, ways of uh, some sort of distribution process. One, one of the specific things that was done during H1N1 was to examine the um, critical uh, individuals in countries as a, as a sort of a minimum level of countermeasure that would be needed and to So do you mean critical how, infrastructure? Exactly. Keeping critical infrastructure right. in countries uh, going? Security, uh, okay. police, fire, you know, what, what number of treatment courses, you know, if we had uh, enough to share, okay. what, would that, what would that minimum number be just as a starting okay. point for negotiation? Great. Adrian. And then I, think, I think before we, <clears throat> before we um, agree that we have a finite resource, we need to really challenge ourselves on the vaccine production. We've seen historically that we can actually produce an Ebola vaccine in a year. Um, it requires flexibility on the regulatory side. It requires commitment from companies. But I, I do think that before we say that a okay. vaccine is not available, we should not slow down on that. We should pursue yes. that. And I think similarly, we need to ex explore how could we accelerate production of our anti uh, antivirals. We've seen it happen before in the HIV crisis. It's possible, but decisions need to be made, and we need to bring the right people together to do that. OK. And for the moment, before we are able to accelerate production of the antiviral. Do you have any initial reaction since you are potentially one of the companies that could be part of this deliberation? What we've seen work uh, very well in the HIV field is in fact procurement through the Global Fund. So having a centralized mechanism, so financial, financially able to procure on behalf of affected countries okay. would be critical. I think the second thing, the second thing is um, it's going to be very important that for the business sector, for manufacturers of anti antivirals that we have clarity around what the need is and where the need is and who are making the decisions. So who's deciding on where they're yeah. going? Okay. So, so can I add to that? Yes. So one of the challenges we have is what to do in the really short term about the supply of vaccines, antivirals, etc. Because low to middle income countries will be concerned that the entire supply chain will be tied up by the time they can even figure out how to finance. Uh, their purchases. Mm -hmm. We know, and we know this from what happened with H1N1, that if you can stop something early in terms of everything from ring fencing in particular countries, but also to look at the transmission from country to country, and there's a variety of measures that can be taken to do that, but unless that is done in a global context and it's done very early, we will end up with a situation where the entire supply chain will have gone. <coughs> so what we need to do at the very outset is figure out what the likely route of transmission is and move very quickly to secure supplies and distribute supplies according to whatever epidemiological protocol we, and based on what Steve says, as we know, <coughs> we already know some things about the transmission of this disease. But unless we do that whilst doing what we can do on vaccine, I agree, um, we will have this get out of control. Okay, Tim. I agree with yeah, you. we'll I think, go down the line. Um, it's important and it's, it's <coughs> fantastic to have this information in front of us because if you look across the countries, you've got very different uh, patterns already. Chile seems to have a 3% case fatality rate, Ecuador, a 5%. So, what's going on there? And are there lessons in terms of how they're managing the outbreak, uh, which might inform uh, ways in which you're going to decrease the need? 
um, for scarce resources? Are they more effective at, um, in their support of treatment? Uh, or what is it that's explaining what look to be significantly different patterns mm -hmm. in the outbreak mm -hmm. of the epidemic? Uh, the second point is that um, these are all middle-income countries or high-income countries. And uh, as, as Jane mentioned, uh, low-income countries are either their surveillance systems aren't sensitive enough to detect cases that are already there, uh, or um, are worried that, in fact, um, uh, they will be uh, at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the World Bank uh, would probably be proactively um, moving into exercising what we call a CERC, uh, which is a contingency emergency response component to existing loans to low and middle income countries in which they can repurpose those loans for uh, these types of emergencies. So I think on the financing side, uh, the CERCs, uh, which are, are built into every loan uh, made uh, by the bank, could be exercised okay. in such a way that um, uh, you don't have the problem of the lack of resources being the primary constraint uh, for the purchase of um, uh, those uh, scarce Enterprise. commodities. Okay, Latoya? I agree, I agree, because <clears throat> financially, that's one of the things we'll have to look at. We have to have the financial means to start production, mass production, and getting companies on board. It's about buy-in and having an understanding of where we're moving forward with this disease process, how quickly and rapidly it's, it's uh, proliferating, and also, utilizing the materials that we do know, like the protective equipment that we already have. We know it's airborne, so ensuring that companies that are manufacturing these products have their financial, uh, have the financial ability to be able to do such. So that way, even if we are in the process of continuing to um, you know, develop this drug, there is some type of protection that's going on to the lower, okay. lower companies. Great. So I'm going to keep going down the line, but at, just in terms of the initial reactions, do we think, as Adrian suggested, that there should be some kind of international uh, resource or distribution method, or really, are we? Is this is this going to be every country for itself <clears throat> doing what it can to procure no. N95 masks, antivirals for itself? And so, uh, just think about that as you're making your comments. Yeah. Well, Order. I do think that there needs to be a, sort of an honest broker, a centralized command and control uh, organization that really brings together the public-private sector, both on a global approach and also on a local approach, because we can't forget uh, that transparency and communications at the local level are going to be critical in the continued, to, to stop the continued spread. But, but I do think there needs to be some form of centralized approach to really organize all the various efforts that are going to be undertaken. Okay, I think a lot of people want to get in here. Uh, we'll go around the table, Martin, Sophia, Chris, and then George. Thank you. I fully support the centralized approach in this state we have already. Uh, if it comes also to global distribution of any products. And I would like to go back to uh, Stephen's first statement. We had parallel to this. We should really focus on how the spread could be controlled better or easily. If I talk about logistics for, for uh, globally distributed topics, we need to protect the staff that is responsible for this. If they don't protect it, they won't do this. And then the entire chain breaks apart within no days. So we really have to do it bo both parallel to find out possible ways to protect the people that are in chain for this, and it should be centralized, uh, organized, otherwise it will not, not work. So you're saying that the people who are delivering these medicines and moving them around the world, they should be protected yes. by these medicines? Yes. Than 95 I mean, there's, there's basic protection anyway in a phase like this, but uh, we should enlarge this with the newest uh, information we have about spreading. Only with this we can guarantee that any, any uh, distribution is, a po is a possible at all. Okay. Sophia? Thank you. Yes, I agree. And I wanted to speak to the point about having the honest broken. I think in this regard, the United Nations fits the bill. Um, I think that given that uh, the countries most affected are those that are low and middle income countries with unequal access to technology, to, to finances, uh, the UN has a, a worldwide uh, footprint, universally uh, recognized and uh, universal membership. And I think 
taking the example of the Ebola crisis uh, last round when a trust fund was uh, established and calling on member states who are capable of contributing to that trust fund in order to help those that are least capable, uh, the low and middle income countries. Thank you. Chris? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I, I want to agree with a couple of comments. One is about the need to prioritize for the, the basic, the frontline health workers, the, the basic people to keep the system working. I, I think it's important to recognize that we have the data that you're showing because of some remarkable international collaboration about sharing information in real time about the patterns of disease. And that's come out of the international <coughs> health regulations, and that's a good first step. If we're now going to try to prioritize the allocation of scarce commodities, having this kind of dashboard to know where those masks and drugs are and, and to, to get at some of the psychology that's behind some of the hoarding. People may be making bad decisions because they, they think it's more scarce than it actually is. So if we could have the equivalent of this dashboard to understand where the supplies are to map to the needs, a global stockpile would certainly help ensure more rational and strategic allocation. But the reality is that we don't have the logistics capability, even within the UN, to bring that together in one place and run it. So this is where I think a collaboration between the international organizations like the World Health <laughs> Organization and the private sector, which runs these supply chains for many purposes every day, understand where the supplies are, make smart decisions about how to allocate them to the people who need them in the places that need them the most, and then work with the industry to move those supplies from where they are today to where they need to be. On your point of transparency and data about where supplies are, where medicines are, where N95 masks are, we couldn't agree more. We, we've been unable to find that data, so I think it's an important need that you just surfaced. George? Yes, I would uh, support for the proposal, you know, centralized or co coordinated effort, not just national, also internationally. You know, uh, at such a situation, that's very, very, very important. And when you read all this uh, about EPI data, R0 is two. You know, it's relatively, you can see the number is there. Especially when you are talking about some country like China or any country who have the largest population of the swine, peak production. So if the virus yet still, you know, transmitted from peak, peak still in the cycle. So that could be very serious. So we have to prior prioritize. So maybe the farmers or whoever have access to it. So that's very important to have the expert to, accept, to assess. The possibility, you see the iron ore, but you also see it's swine origin. I will still have some new virus from swine, from pigs, or the virus already circulated in the human beings. That's also, we should put that into account for the strategy for the allocation of the, um, the actual vena. And also, I got the information from my staff. Looks like, of course, you know, we have capacity to produce the extra nerve, but uh, even you know, think about the population we have. We, we can't pan our uh, capacity. But you know the, what we have, even not enough for our po own population. Tom. That's the question we should take. Yes, I think I think it's important in 2019 to remember uh, that in 2016, uh, the World Economic Forum, together with the World Food Program, mm -hmm. presented a global supply chain management approach for this exact scenario. And what might be helpful, given that everybody suffers from. Uh, short-term memory deficit is to have an emergency briefing on those resources that are global public goods that are there to s facilitate uh, supply chain uh, management and where, where those can be deployed. But also um, CEPI, uh, which was uh, established three years ago uh, at, to accelerate vaccines exactly in development in these settings where a coronavirus is, in fact, one of its indications and first uh, areas of focus, um, that may not be common knowledge. Likewise, on the financing, uh, there is global financing. Uh, the criteria identified here would be triggers for the pandemic emergency financing facility, which would disperse a significant mm -hmm. amount of money into that international pool uh, on the basis of this trajectory of the epidemic. So those are resources that uh, may not be well understood amongst the set of players that would appreciate having some understanding. So an emergency briefing on those resources, I think, might make sure that they're not overlooked. Okay. Uh, Steve, and then Matt. 
So a couple of things. First of all, the patients who are currently on extranavir need to receive different medications. So I think this is something that the team needs to look into. How do we make sure that we have the right resources to make sure that they're not uh, being panicked and uh, we're not causing panic with them and, and that we're having to use this drug for a different use um, at this time. Secondly, I think it's very important that we make sure that there is concise communication with all healthcare facilities where these patients are being treated so that there isn't mass panic. And perhaps a member of this team could be part of that task force to ensure that whether it's um, in the news, by social media, or to these hospitals, we have the right communications channel to be able to um, make sure that the public does not have uh, mass panic. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Yeah. I was just going to, uh, I'll add to that in as much as the value of a centralized convening body um, that is addressing both the production uh, and supply chain also serves as a convening enterprise around the communications. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is a lot of great data that's been collected, but probably more can be done from a public education perspective mm -hmm. around containment prevention um, while the supply chain is managed. Ivan? I just want to echo Matt's uh, point, and my question here is uh, what's, what's happening around the world while you know, we know that there are cases here in these few countries, what's happening to the rest of Asia, what are governments doing to assure the people, and this will help to relax some of the stress that you see in terms of people hoarding uh, personal protection equipment. So I think it requires a, a global coordination and not just at the individual country specific level. Yeah, Brad? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on Christopher's uh, scarcity comment. Uh, it's not just scarcity, it's also severity, and that's why we see different rates of, of, of uh, fatalities, 5% to 3%. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a stakeholder maybe missing here, and I may be wrong, but um, is the provider, and who's taking care of these patients? Because there's, there's definitely discrepancies here on, on fatality rates. Um, we know in, in, in panic, in psychology of panic, um, people start hoarding. People start, you know, freaking out and wondering, <laughs> what, what should I do? And, and then countries start doing it, and then there's all kinds of uh, dysfunctional decisions made. Um, providers really need to be at the table uh, talking about how they're taking care of the patients um, and, and diagnostics and what they're doing with it because uh, we're, we're, we're jumping to a little bit of a conclusion that this is going to spread everywhere to the same degree. <laughs> Um, and this leads to hoarding, and, and I'll, I'll share with you the, the in SARS, uh, SARS um, N95s, there's still N95s sitting in boxes um, yeah. that were never used. I mean, mm -hmm. the hoarding of that was, was atrocious. I mean, and, and, and then there were knockoffs of N95s that really weren't truly impervious masks mm -hmm. that were made and then, sp and, and then distributed. <coughs> so I, I, think there's, um, I think there's a need to have the providers in the discussion to see really what they're doing to treat the patients, how okay. severe is the, the, the epidemic. So just on severity, it's important for you all to know that our <clears throat> the, the estimate from our team and from other ministries of health is that the distinctions in case fatality rate represent distinctions in data collection, uh, not that the disease is any different. The, it looks like the virus is the same around the world. These are different healthcare systems, different data collection, different surveillance. So overall, our all-in case fatality rate is somewhere in the order of 7% to 10%. It depends on where we are in the world. And in terms of where the disease is in the world, we see lots of blank spots, and we think that's partly or largely due to surveillance systems mm -hmm. and the slowness in collecting this data in certain parts of the world. We expect that to come online quickly. Absolutely. Steve, and then or Avril, you haven't had a chance. No, Steve. Go ahead. I think you haven't had a chance. Okay, sure. I, I mean, I think it's just in terms of the precise question being asked, it's clear that uh, having everybody go with on their own, it's not going to be the most effective answer, right? So I absolutely agree with the comments that have been made that we need to have some kind of international mechanism for coordinating what it is that we would be doing, also for collecting information, also for understanding what the resources are that are available through international mechanisms to execute on that allocation and coordination. I think it's challenging to set it up in a way that says that international mechanism has to be the body that decides in all circumstances what the allocation is. In other words, I think states are going to want to be able to decide for themselves on, in some circumstances some of the issues that are relevant. So one of the challenges will be ensuring that you're using an existing mechanism, and I think Sophia's right about the UN as being sort of the base of operations in a sense, um, both for the funding but also for a whole series of other issues that you would be looking at for allocation, coordination, et cetera. But then making sure that states are stepping up to actually tell people what it is that they're doing, what their decisions are in that context, and creating transparency about what the proper allocation should be for containing 
this issue so that there can be pressure put to bear on ensuring that states are actually doing what the larger plan needs to be in that context. Can I ask a follow-up question? If there, if there is a centralized stockpile developed either at the WHO or perhaps somewhere else in the UN system, if you were <coughs> going to suggest that or some other entity, how much can you imagine states contributing of the supplies that are being made in their own countries? Is this a 1% allocation, 20% of the supply that they're making? We've already heard from George that China's not making nearly enough medication to take care of China at this point. So what is the desired end state here? Can you, from a, from a state security perspective, if someone who's worked at the top of government, what do you imagine states who have this medication doing? I mean, I think it, the percentage will depend on the details, right, and mm -hmm. what it is that you're capable of actually producing in the context of the particular crisis. But, and I don't know how much we're able to produce under this circumstance. I think there should be and there would be, from a public perspective and a public health perspective, right, enormous uh, interest in promoting an allocation to international efforts um, that would actually contain the issue as quickly as possible, right? And that should be the focus for everybody in the sense of that's what's gonna actually help you prevent the downstream impact of what the trajectory holds for us. So uh, the question is, can you, through this international mechanism, really promote commitments mm -hmm. to doing this as quickly as possible and give people a sense that actually if they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance of protecting their own populations and their country's security. Okay. Another number of comments. I'll just jump in. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, to be completely clear, most uh, of this production would already be committed in contracts. Yes. Uh, it is almost unheard of that people are producing product without having a forward commitment for the consumption of that product. So the first thing that needs to be done, because this is not something that the countries currently control, unless countries are going to bring about emergency situations and co-opt an existing supply chain. So the first thing to do is to figure out where that's going. Now, in H1N1, uh, in a number of cases, so the Australian government, we bought vaccine to the extent we could get it. And in some instances, we actually gave some of that vaccine. We actually gave some of that vaccine to the United States who actually ended up with a supply shortage at that particular point. So inconsistent we is, uh, working out where the biggest vulnerabilities are, the first thing you need to do is figure out who's got control of those supply chains and those products, and then figure out where for the greater global good it should be deployed. But we need to be clear. Any government who says, I'm going to ship every single dose of a particular product offshore is going to end up with a challenge domestically. Mm -hmm. So m giving governments the capacity to manage both their domestic mm -hmm. concerns together with being good players. And we know from the PIP framework that companies will similarly contribute, but it's <coughs> got to be in an organized framework. Okay. And, and that challenge, I think, is being proved out with the increasing <coughs> rhetoric both by candidates in the US, UK, and Germany who are saying that globalism is responsible for this pandemic and therefore there's a rising protectionist nature um, to take care of their own. Um, and so I think it's an instance where the business, health, and scientific communities need to uh, combat that rising uh, rhetoric and misleading information. Yeah, and last a couple of comments here. We have about two minutes before we have to close. So I think one thing that's going to be very important is to uh, define the aim of mm -hmm. using the countermeasure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from what we know right now, it doesn't seem likely from the data we've had presented that this countermeasure is going to suppress transmission, is going to lead to containment. So yes. our aim really would be to um, minimize the severe severity and to prevent death rather than to prevent the, the you know this emerging pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, second thing I wanted to say is just how important communication is, and that is true to the public. This is a very alarming situation, and I think yeah. public communication sh shouldn't be alarming, but should be truthful about how severe it is. I think also internally, um, as negotiations are going on to, uh, to share countermeasures, um, it, I think it's not likely, I agree, that, that countries are not going to buy, uh, buy a countermeasure to put into a global supply without retaining a large portion of it for mm -hmm. themselves. Um, the last thing I'd say is this is a very dynamic situation. The countries will be negotiating with manufacturers, and I think that's got to be figured into whatever agreement is reached. And whatever that sharing agreement is, 
it won't be perfect. And I think we shouldn't, it's just gotta be done quickly so that sharing can actually take place rather than trying to get something that's exactly the way everyone wants it. And do you think that governments are gonna need to break contracts, have companies break contracts in order to redirect antivirals? Um, I, I think that that would work best for the countries to make the decisions with uh -huh. the countermeasures that they purchased. Okay. I think that's a very, you know, from a, we're not talking about one supply chain, but we're multiple supply chains here. And I think, you know, before we start uh, talking about companies uh, withdrawing antiretrovirals from patients with HIV who have a disease, we need to really understand how, how those ARVs will be used in patients who may or may not have a disease. So demand forecasting will be critical. And I also want to point out it's not just the, the, uh, the healthcare workers, that we have supply chains in middle income countries. Often those are very um, resource dense, people in small spaces producing masks. We have to think about the integrity and the health of the supply chain. Okay. Uh, uh, going back yes. to Stephen's note real quick uh, about the public uh, communication, my team has been monitoring the public response um, and on various social media channels and cable networks there's been uh, some conspiracy theories that are around about uh, the potential that pharmaceutical companies or the UN have released this for their own benefit. So as we move forward, obviously trust in pharmaceuticals and government is very important at this moment. And so as we okay. move forward uh, with developing the right um, scenarios, we have to make sure that the public communication is a, is a major part of that okay. because of these conspiracy theories. Thank you. We have to close. I'll give you we have 30 seconds. Okay, yeah, but this fully supports Steve's input. Uh, we should not search for the perfect solution right now. Yeah. We, we, we run against time. And if conspiracy theories like this come up already, so we are on the edge of hysterical reactions, and then it gets out of control. And that's the thing what should be the main driver for us now to find a solution. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to bring these recommendations uh, together and communicate them broadly at the conclusion of this meeting. Thank you all for your input. We will conclude this meeting and we'll reconvene shortly. Yes, and that does conclude the first meeting of the board. The scenario now advances three weeks to November 7, 2019, to the second meeting of the Pandemic Emergency Board. Thank you all for reconvening on short notice. Let's get an update on the pandemic. <laughs> Very short notice. Dr. Thanks, Tom. Rivers. In the last three weeks, we've seen a significant escalation of the pandemic. Previous projections appear to have been accurate. We've gone from about 35,000 cases to more than 260,000 estimated case cases, with 13,000 deaths. This may be an underestimate. We know that there is a good deal of underreporting due to lack of surveillance in many parts of the world. The greatest number of reported cases are still in South America where the pandemic started, but the number of countries affected has risen from eight to 23 across the Americas, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. We expect the spread will continue to accelerate as we have more outbreaks. We project that in one month, we could see upwards of 2 million cases and over 100,000 deaths. And in three months, there could be as many as 20 million cases and 1.6 million deaths. The markets are reacting negatively to these projections, with some markets now in the red for the year. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. All right, we want to show you the latest news on the impacts of the pandemic on trade and travel, which will be the focus of this discussion. <clears throat> In addition to global public health crisis, CAPS is creating havoc with the trade and travel industries. The frightening public health toll of CAPS continues to mount. Patients are overwhelming healthcare facilities around the world, including many of the makeshift triage and temporary care facilities. People are avoiding public spaces out of fear of infection and in compliance with public health recommendations. This has had a dramatic effect on the retail and service sectors. Businesses of all kinds are struggling to operate, let alone provide basic services as their workers have fallen sick or refused to come to work. Some companies have allowed telecommuting, but for most businesses and employees, this is not an option. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. 
Consumer confidence has fallen dramatically and people are delaying or canceling discretionary purchases. As a result, manufacturers are scaling back production on many goods. On the other hand, staples like food and medicine are being hoarded. Mandated border closures and trade restrictions are creating severe localized shortages. The Purchasing Managers Index suffered its sharpest decline in 50 years, a leading indicator that markets are preparing for a prolonged period of economic disruption. In some regions, politicians are adding to the noise and confusion through social media. Ban all goods and travel from infected countries and boycott companies that spread disease are common Twitter refrains often led by public figures. It's safe to say we face a tough dilemma. The movement of people may facilitate the spread of gaps, but interruptions to travel and trade may have economic consequences that are just as bad. And to give us more detail on these issues before <coughs> our discussion, Lucia Mullen. Caps is spreading and it's largely due to the movement of people. Individuals from affected regions traveling to unaffected areas and susceptible people traveling to affected areas and getting sick. Travel poses real health risks, both of spreading the disease and of travelers getting sick. In fact, many travelers to affected regions have gotten sick and some have died. Many countries have issued travel advisories for affected parts of South America. Additionally, politicians in a number of countries have called for bans on all travel and imports from affected countries. A few countries have actually banned all inbound travel and some trade from those countries. The total number of reported cases is currently about 30 times the total we saw with SARS and 100 times the number of MERS cases so far. And disruptions to both local and global travel and trade are commensurately greater. On the other hand, public health experts inform us that travel and trade bans and fever screens are not effective at preventing importation of a highly contagious respiratory illness. Studies suggest that at best, they can delay importation by a few weeks. Some countries have advised against travel to countries in South America. Others are advising against traveling to any country with cases. A few countries have even put bans in place for persons or goods coming from countries with cases. These disruptions are beginning to have major economic consequences for the South American region and will soon have cascading effects globally. We are anticipating far greater disruptions to trade and travel may be on the horizon. One prominent economist estimates that global GDP could fall an additional 4% as a result of travel and trade restrictions. This would cause a severe global recession. Such a severe recession has the potential to result in both high unemployment and runaway inflation, creating the groundwork for national instability and change in the global political landscape. So the policy crisis for the board to consider in this meeting is this. How should national leaders, businesses, and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans. So what does this board recommend? And remember, as we're thinking about this, that this pandemic is now already 10 times as large as the 2014 West Africa Ebola outbreak and growing exponentially. So your views, we've got a, a, a big dilemma. <clears throat> People moving, carrying disease, we can't stop trade and travel or else we risk economic consequence. Well, I think that we need to uh, evaluate the capacity of these communities that are being severely impacted in Brazil and Ecuador to assure that we don't create a humanitarian crisis there mm -hmm. and that they don't have the ability to sustain the community, which will just create more widespread panic mm -hmm. and hence more spreading of the disease. I support this way that yeah. uh, they should be maintained a basic interaction between those countries. I remember SARS at the time for us, Hong Kong was mainly affected and we still maintained an exchange of travel, an exchange of <coughs> transporting goods and it helped both parties. Of course, there was the risk of importing infected 
persons to Europe, uh, but they we maintained it with the uh, respective countermeasures, and it was successful at the end of the day. It was difficult, but it should be our basic philosophy to go through this as long as possible. I think, thank you for that example. I think in this case, we can be sure that if we allow trade and travel to happen, we will have continued spread. But I think for us, the, the question is, is it worth it anyway? People are gonna spread the disease, but we have to keep trade and travel going in the world despite that. That's the question, or one of the questions. Steve? I, I think that th this is a, a complex question, but I think there is an analytic <coughs> approach to this that would okay. provide an answer, which is what benefit is there from those interventions that you could implement, and is there any at all? And if there's not, yeah. at least from an analytic standpoint, it's a pretty clear cut um, decision as to what should be done. That, that doesn't make the decision, but it needs mm -hmm. to be a part of the decision making process. And could you imagine conditions in which, for example, CDC would withdraw travel advisories? Um, if you yes. knew that they were contributing to well, I think, travel intrigue I think the, chaos? The, um, I could give the ex an example from H1N1 where we had a time-limited uh, advisory um, against travel to affected areas in Mexico, and after a short period of time, it became clear that if you live in the United States, your risk of getting disease is greater in the yeah. United States than it would be from a person traveling okay. from Mexico. So that mm -hmm. that is actually very, a very helpful kind of analysis just to, to make sure okay. that you're, it's not just uh, pure harm. Chris and Jane? Yeah, I, I think we have to avoid thinking of whether this is a binary decision of whether there should be trade or travel or not. I think there has to be informed uh, travel. I think you know having advisories that let people know about what, if they are going to travel, what they need to do st to stay safe. And that has to incorporate some of the things we talked about in the last meeting about what's the likely availability of personal protection equipment or treatment should they fall ill while they're traveling. And in trade, we have to understand, again, how do we protect the people who are involved in keeping the global uh, infrastructure of trade and logistics going? We need that infrastructure mm -hmm. to move healthcare workers, to move healthcare commodities. We, we shouldn't take blunt instruments. We should actually protect the people engaged in making the international trading system work and inform people who are gonna travel with or without a ban um, uh, and, and make sure they're making informed decisions rather than saying travel yes or no. Okay, Jane. I, I was gonna make a very similar point, so let me make a slightly different one, but I agree with everything that Chris has said. We know that if you try and put a, a border between peoples who actually have reason to travel, they will go around you. And we also know that people will then hide issues around disease. So the question about how you give people the best information so they can protect themselves. And in Australia's case, in theory, we could close our borders. But let's be completely clear. Um, we probably have enough fuel supplies to last us maybe a month. So in, in a practical sense, very, very often, there's not a lot you can do but to keep trade and travel going. But exactly as Chris says, it has to be done in a nuanced way. And for those of us who traveled through Asia during SARS, I was one of those people. Being informed about what I needed to do to protect <coughs> myself was a really important part of okay. how we handled that. Thank you, Tim. So yeah, I, I think uh, in the same vein, the last two comments. First is I think uh, the International Health Regulator Regulations Committee, uh, Emergency Committee, should be issuing rational advice on how to best protect oneself, recognizing that this is, is, this is already out of the bottle. But there may be ways in which uh, certain constituencies can protect themselves. Um, and, and those should be issued as guidance uh, to, to manage um, unnecessary spread or prevent uh, unnecessary risk. Secondly, um, I think it's really important for this board to be looking at one month and three months and saying what is the essential business continuity that we have to establish now because this is only gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at what's, um, what are the most important functions to keep not only the global economy going but also uh, essential basic commodities to, to make sure that uh, we're not going to get into fuel and food and other critical shortages that are going to accelerate uh, economic contraction. So I think it's very important now to start projecting out to identify with the key constituencies that are responsible as mm -hmm. part of the global ecosystem for managing um, uh, life uh, uh, you know, critical um, supply, uh, uh, trade, and uh, activity 
to get those constituencies mobilized and begin to identify essential continuity okay. plans. We are going to actually talk about that explicitly in a bit, and I thank you for raising that. Latoya. Um, and looking at my sector, we know that travel is the basis and hospitality. Travel and hospitality is the basis of what we do. And limiting bans, you know, putting potential bans in, that has a wide economic effect on those particular areas. And so, uh, and devastating consequences, because we're looking at individuals who may not be able to earn a living, and it moves forward from that um, point. One thing you look at is your business continuity plan that you have as uh, a private sector industry and see where you can uh, manipulate or even uh, look at the, the minutia of the plan to see how you can assist those areas in which they're most affected to lessen the economic strain. Thank you. If a number of people want to get in, we'll just move around the table this way. For those who haven't had a comment yet, Levon? Yeah. Um, so I've received a note to say that the supply chains are already being disrupted with <laughs> employees refusing to come to work unless they're provided with uh, PPE. So you know, along the same lines, the business continuity plan actually kicks in already. And I would say that uh, for the rest of the business activity, so those that may not be directly impacted, they should start <laughs> exercising some of those business continuity plans as well. And I think there needs to be a concerted effort by the government to get the message out. This is a good time for us to use social media as well to, to try to get people to be a little bit more calm. So the, the message needs to come across quite strongly, I believe. Getting the message out is one important thing that we really should follow up clearly also from our industry. I mean, there are so many rumors around. There are so many aspects around. And this has a very, very heavy impact, like Latoya also mentioned, for their industry. We have to keep this up. We have to try to maintain a basic service all over. Otherwise, the system mm -hmm. will collapse. And uh, it, it fa at the moment, it really faces on, on rumors and on, on aspects that are a fact that we transport affected passengers. Yes, that's a fact. We cannot, cannot mm -hmm. neglect this. But uh, we should deal with this somehow. And still uh, travel and, and uh, maintaining the system is partial and crucial that we can have any efforts also with the outlook to the future to the next months. And travel advisories are also impacting reporters who aren't able to get to the impacted areas, so the right information is not being disseminated. Uh, a lot of the information that is going out to the public is through social media, so as we put out those travel advisories, mm -hmm. there's a real need to make sure that the newsrooms have the right information to know when their news reporters are going to be safe, and how can we get the right information disseminated rather than hearsay on social media. Thank you. And I think to Tim's point about long, <coughs> short and midterm planning, a stakeholder can community that needs to be engaged mm -hmm. is the technology and te telecommunications mm -hmm. industries. More remote work could be a possible mm -hmm. help in this instance. Excellent. Technology can be the platform, but in an increasingly mobile dependent world, we need to make certain that the telecommunications system can hold up to increased demand and pressure. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think we're concerned that the varying travel policies are going to allow corporations to apply inconsistently hmm. what those policies are, and it's just going to continue to aggravate. You mean national policies? Yes. Okay. So an international approach would be highly desirable for companies that are moving goods. Are real? Yeah. I'm, so I would absolutely agree with the comments that were made by Chris and Jane and, and Tim in terms of how we would think about this moving forward. I think. The other things that I would um, just add into that is that it seems to me that travel bans, one of the concerns with that is also in relation to not just the economic consequences, but your ability to actually respond effectively to mm -hmm. the health issue to begin with. So that clearly has to be a factor that should be addressed in the context of uh, you know, analyzing what the right balance is. In addition, I understand uh, my staff has told me that um, there is concern from the State Department and the White House about instability that would be essentially breaking out potentially in, in South and Central America as a consequence of this. And that's obviously another issue that we would want to factor into what would be the right balance for, for travel. But the final thing I'd just say is that in the United States, certainly we have experienced in the past um, political pressure to basically stop travel when there's panic in the country. And one thing that I think we learned from the Ebola crisis in particular was that stepping out early, communicating as effectively as possible with the public about what it is that you're doing, what you know, informed travel should and should not be, and so on. And, um, but also having a policy and establishing that policy early so that states and others can 
understand this is how we're supposed to be sort of communicating and working with uh, the federal policy on travel on these issues. And I think internationally, you might have a similar scenario in which the World Health Organization, UN and others are saying, this is what we believe to be the best practices for travel. That can be very helpful in trying to manage what the sort of public panic might be in that. So you would advise a common international approach to this to the extent that that's possible, as opposed a to country by country? Coordinated is what I'd say. Coordinated, OK. Yes, uh, Adrian, and then we'll go to George. Just heard from my, my staff, in fact, you know, we need to differentiate between trade and travel. Because what we're seeing now is we're substituting one medical crisis for another medical crisis. We, we can't get the precursors for our drugs shipped to manufacturing plants to be able to supply other conditions, not, not just this, this outbreak. And so we need to think about what is travel. Is it non-essential travel? Is it business travel? I think we have to be clear about are all countries created equal in terms of risk? Mm -hmm. We need to have real clarity of communication around that if we're going to maintain our medical supplies globally. And for global business, for your company, where should that communication be coming from? It should be coming from respected authorities. And so it should be coming from uh, uh, CDCs, WHOs, Departments of Health, and then we should promulgate those as an industry, as we already do through organizations like International SOS, mm -hmm. uh, so that we have um, that, that risk clearly identified. So you raised the question of essential versus non-essential. I just would ask the group, what is essential trade and travel? Do we have a common definition or even a, the beginnings of a definition of what should be essential trade and travel? Well, WHO it will depend on the context. WHO has should a list of WHO's essential, list? Yeah. essential for trade medicines. and travel. Yeah. <laughs> for medicines and supplies or for all trade and travel? I, no, it's, it's just medicines. Medicines, but, okay. Uh, um, it, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's the right question. Okay. I'm sorry, George. Yes, I've got some uh, information from my side. Uh, it looks like some countries already banned or tra uh, travel. And um, it looks like also in China, we have a few hundred uh, cases and also have a dozen death cases. But look at the data. So far, we, we collected. Mm. Looks like, you know, uh, think, about, think about the 209 pandemic, H101, and also uh, Ebola. Of course, you know, it can stop everything. You know, it looks like the numbers would de decrease, but you have to balance between the trade, travel, economics, and you know, uh, the, the social activity, everything together. So in my opinion, think about uh, H1N1 and uh, Ebola. Maybe risk communication and uh, public understanding of the whole situation is more important than the ban mm -hmm. of the traveling and everything. So this is, I would agree with Matthews. You know, spread, the, spread the knowledge spread the knowledge you know, to, to the public by okay. mobiles, all these you know, accessible device. Can, Thank can, you, Sophia. Can did I, you want to comment yeah. on that, <laughs> Sophia yeah, I, want to agree, I want to agree with that. OK. Um, and my staff have advised me that basically the level of support for travel restrictions is somewhere between 57 and 90%. Now, we all know politicians will be influenced by the, the general view in the community. But we can use that in a positive way. The truth of the matter is, if we find ways to retard spread, and if we can work with people, so what we're doing is, one, consistent with uh, meeting their concerns, but we mm -hmm. do it in a way that actually meets the science need. And we did this, we have done this with Ebola, we've done it with flu. So we've got history here, but we need to do it in an orderly and in science-informed <coughs> way. OK, thanks, Sophia. Thank you, and just a note that uh, the UN is now concerned that uh, the travel restriction is now impacting countries that have not even reported any cases and uh, recommends that uh, member states actually uh, follow the WHO guidance, and that means not to uh, implement a travel ban. I think it goes back to the communications um, point that has been made around the table about the informed travel, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, we've reached a point in where um, travel discussions and bans, whether it's personal or commercial, is um, affecting supply chain. And, 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 and there's fear and panic about uh, ships and uh, coming into docks and, mm -hmm. um, you know, supply. So it's starting to interrupt supply chain. So we just, we, you know, we have to just be cautious at this point in the time of the crisis that it's not just about travel because now it's spreading to supply chain issues because, you know, countries or even companies are saying don't let that, you know, ship come into the dock because it's coming from an area that's, right. I think, so it, it's, it's a, it, we, we, it, we can't be siloed in our thinking about, oh, it's just travel ban right now. Right. It's, a, it's starting to affect a broader part of the uh, crisis. So for those of you who work in the global supply chain, what kind of strategic interventions are going to be necessary to keep trade and travel going? Are we going to need to have government bailouts of companies, or are companies going to be able to make it through this crisis? For example, 
Lufthansa or others in your industry? Are we going to need subsidies, liability, remediation, countermeasures? What's it going to take to keep Lufthansa flying? I mean, first of all, it is really that we have open communication, that we try to convince, as Sophia said, governments not to ban each other, especially if it's countries that are not affected. We realized it, I take again the example from, from the SARS crisis, uh, Hong Kong was heavily affected. We had good communication with the government there, with the CDC, and we could find a way to maintain operation, although it was uh, economically a nightmare, 20% booking figures in the planes, for certain periods. So you're but flying we, planes with 20% bookings? Yes, but we, How long kept, can you? we kept flying. Okay, that time it was one destination. If it's worldwide, 20% booking figures, we have to adapt the network. We will not maintain this for several <laughs> weeks. That's the case. But uh, that's why it's so important. And once again with Sofia, we have to spread this out clearly. Countries that are not affected should be served on a normal basis. Countries that are affected should be served on a adapted basis, uh, what is necessary, but still should be served. And we need a clear and open communication. Jane mentioned it as well. What is essential, what is non-essential travel, we have to clarify this. Otherwise, if we go down to 20% bookings over a long period, the company will run down. That's a fact. I should just say on this chart, this is the information <laughs> that we have, but I think most public health experts presume that there are cases in many more countries. So I think it would be false reassurance to say, we can keep flying to this country because there are no cases. We don't know that there are cases, but we believe that there are cases that haven't been detected yet. Huh? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I, I, I think it's really important to have a plan uh, that identifies uh, the dozen or two dozen trade and uh, travel uh, sector players that need to get together and agree on how they're going to have a collective business continuity. And, and, and it, it, it's the sort of thing where you need the leadership of those industries to gather. And they have to come together in a, in a, in a way which perhaps is unusual, uh, but where there should be some government incentive to, to collectively organize and perhaps help to buffer the crisis um, with, uh, with whatever fiscal measures might do that uh, collectively to make it clear that it, the, uh, on the imperative for keeping the system moving. But I, I want to suggest that it's really important that that be done in a pluralistic way rather than a singular effort across all sectors. Because if there's some sense that there's a UN institution that can do all of this, mm -hmm. then I, I, I worry we're suffering from a delusional disorder mm -hmm. on the power of the UN. Uh, it's really important to get those industries and their trade associations and a, an efficient leadership established which is decentralized uh, but has a collective responsibility and accountability. And that needs to be supported by um, the public uh, leadership. So government leaders. Yes. Should be, should be behind that. Yes, Latoya. I agree with that 100%. And looking at your business continuity plans and getting together with industries that subsidize what, what your company is doing and using the government as a... Um, alternative or another method of understanding what's going on and utilizing their leadership, have it decentralized because that way no one particular industry is getting more than the next. So that way it leads everything even across the board. I see. So you so industry should be the travel industry should be broadly part of that we need discussion to be broadly about a part coordinating of that. international approach. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I think we also need to think about the uh, healthcare workers who are traveling to some of these countries on a normal basis. A lot of these healthcare workers from different hospitals that are going to, to provide aid on a normal basis for different diseases. Are we now helping them understand how to take care of those patients in those countries? And how do we make sure that we're not causing panic among, among the hospitals um, and other healthcare organizations like Doctors Without Borders or various hospitals that have global efforts to ensure that they're not uh, causing panic and, and pulling their teams away from those countries that may really need them right now? Okay, and Sophia and then Chris. Or Latoya, I just wanted to, want to jump, utilize in? That, jump in on that. And to utilize uh, companies such as ourselves that have a vast healthcare system within our properties. So that's one thing we've done before. We have actually mobilized. We have nurses and nurse practitioners that work around the world for our company, and we can mobilize them and assist in you know, providing care. OK, Sophia. Thank you. I just wanted to get back to your point about the non-reporting. And um, 
in some instances, it could come down to c capability and capacities of the mm -hmm. health sector in the particular country concerned. And I think this is where uh, an organization like the United Nations can be of help by providing framework guidance that others could use and to help in the deployment of health professionals to these, those parts of the world that um, are lacking in the, uh, in the capability. But ultimately, governments have to be capable of asking for help. Um, and also to take action in themselves. The UN, <coughs> I agree with Tim, can be there and in a supportive capacity to coordinate, to assist, but it will run into the question of sovereignty every time. And so um, <laughs> governments need to be empowered and, and uh, capable of, of okay. helping their citizens. Thank you. Chris? Thanks, Tom. Two points I'd like to make. One is to just second the comments that Adrian and Brad made about the need for us to distinguish between travel and trade and to really begin to focus, especially given some of the projections of two and maybe 20 million cases within three months, to really define what is the critical part of the global supply chain infrastructure. We won't have the drugs if we can't move the active pharmaceutical agents from one place to another. Um, we really need to focus on what will it take to keep that global logistics infrastructure running. We've heard already that some workers are not willing to come to work because they don't, they're not confident they'll have the personal protective equipment. They need to be prioritized in mm -hmm. terms of access to the countermeasures, et cetera. And that, I, you know, I think the travel issue, I think, you know, we shouldn't use blunt instruments, have bans when bans don't work, have, make sure people are making informed decisions. If we go to two or 20 million cases, people are going to make decisions not to travel. Um, uh, and, and so we need to really focus on the, the critical infrastructure necessary to move health commodities, to move fuel to places that are going to require fuel to keep their hospitals mm -hmm. running, to Pl keep food plasma. moving. You know, there's a whole complex set of issues in a highly interdependent world on supply chains that are just in time. We need to think about how much flex there is in that just in time supply chain system and make sure it keeps running. I think it's going to take specificity. And it's going to take knowledge that only the private sector has. The UN can play an important coordinating facilitation role, but the companies know where those commodities are, where they move, how to move them. And that's where a, a, a type of public-private collaboration that we have not generally had in these crises needs to be put together pretty quickly. Some, very similar to what Tim was saying, I think. Yeah, here. Um, but if I could just follow up on that, I think the complement might be um, mobilizing the G20 finance ministers. Um, the reason the G20 got together initially was the Asian financial crisis. Um, and it may be that, um, uh, in fact, that there's a role for them to, to not only incent the private sector, but then also look what those complementary set of, pu of uh, public sector financing measures could be, which would actually lower the bar or make it much more attractive to ride this out into the future in a way that um, uh, companies are going to be able to get shareholder engagement, et cetera. Thank you. Eduardo, your, your business is moving things around the world. Yes. What's it going to take to keep it going? And, and just to underscore the point that cooperation among supply chain providers or businesses that have huge supply chains mm -hmm. can add a lot of efficiency to the whole process and be protective of healthcare workers to make sure that even the delivery systems workers are also taken care of using multimodal, right? air, land, and sea. So there could be a lot of cooperation with the Lufthansa's and the UPS's and others throughout the world to, to really consolidate trade lanes to make sure that the, uh, the commodities get to where they need to get to. Does that happen now? Or is that something that has been imagined already and worked on? Or no, I think that happens, that happens today. It does. You know, there is a huge freight forwarder network. Uh, you know, we do not land UPS brown tails everywhere in the, in the world, so there are cooperations uh, among companies. So we could build on this. Yes. Okay. Steve. Um, I think the statement about what would happen even in the absence of any government intervention, travel would decrease. People are not going to, they're going to know what the information is about where disease is mm -hmm. and not travel there. I think that there is an important role for government to not make a bad situation worse, mm -hmm. and that is largely going to be communicating um, valid and trusted information about where the problem is so that people can make their own decisions and that whatever guidance the government, national governments do provide is, uh, is tailored to where, what the situation actually is. I, I think there is a spectrum of interventions all the way from just saying, 
you know, hey, there's a disease here to uh, something that exists today. If you're pregnant, don't travel to a malarious area. I mean, that's a, there, there are travel guidances in place all the time of, of that sort. But let, let's be clear. People trust, trust less and less what comes from government. They're <coughs> actually enabling many sources of information, Google, Facebook, Mm -hmm. uh, the free-to-air media yeah. networks, the ensuring that they are equipped, companies who will talk to their staff. And we know that very often these days people believe much more uh, something that will come from their company than they will believe something that comes from government. So we have to partner. Well, yeah, we, we, I just wanted to say that we are actually going to get explicitly into communication yeah. shortly in a subsequent discussion, so maybe you could hold that thought yeah. for one moment. But just in closing, it sounds like there is a kind of a support here at the table for developing some kind of international coordinated approach for identifying the most important trade that's happening in the world, the essential services uh, for their collaboration between business and governments. Any final comment, last 30 seconds? Let's make a comment about the, the security of supply. You know, industries need to take a leading role in making sure that the, the key providers upstream of commodities for their final products that there are simple things in place, like for example, if going to a factory is a dangerous place, what are we doing in the factories to change that? Are people wearing masks? Mm -hmm. So there are probably very simple things that industries and trade associations could work on for critical commodities. Okay, well then we'll leave it there. We have to leave it there for time. Thank you all for your input. Our team again will take the board's recommendations and promulgate them widely to decision makers around the world. And this concludes this meeting. Great, and we will now take a 15 minute break and reconvene the exercise at 10.35. Thank you. Welcome back. Please silence your phones. We now pick up the scenario three weeks later at the third meeting of the board on November 29th, 2019. Thank you all for reconvening at short notice. We need to present to this board a serious new issue related to the economic fallout that is accruing over the pandemic. <clears throat> Let's start by getting the latest numbers and distribution from Dr. Rivers. The CAPS pandemic continues to grow with more than 1 million cases and an estimated 73,000 deaths worldwide. There are, these are only estimates because many countries are having trouble keeping up with surveillance and laboratory testing. Our models are showing that with this continued rate of spread, there may be 5.5 million cases and almost 350,000 deaths in one month. The three-month projection is alarming, with potential for over 30 million cases and 3 million deaths. The Americas are still the most severely affected, but there are large outbreaks occurring in many countries across the globe. Countries with limited healthcare infrastructure have seen the highest death rates so far, but healthcare systems in high-income countries are also becoming overwhelmed. Financial markets have tumbled, with all down significantly for the year. Economic disruptions are being felt across the globe. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. So now let's look at this recent exchange on GNN that focused on the economic and financial crises that are rippling around the world. <coughs> the response to the CAPS pandemic is now the most expensive international emergency ever. Political leaders around the globe are faced with many impossible dilemmas, including financial. We have two guests today to discuss the bottom line of catastrophic response. First up is economist Dave Gamble. Are we out of money? The best way to answer that is no, we are not out of money yet. But the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. You have been quite vocal about that and generated some controversy along the way. Well, look, you know me, I try to avoid controversy. But come on, common sense says it shouldn't be controversial to suggest a response should prioritize both lives and livelihoods. Absolutely, we need to save lives. We all know someone who's been affected by caps. But we literally cannot afford a heavy-handed response that suffocates our economy. Pragmatism is a wise choice. I mean, what exactly are the risks and benefits of slowing air travel, of staying home from work, closing schools, disrupting supply chains, interfering with our reliable channels of communication and news. Sure, some of these steps can help slow caps, but often only marginally and with serious costs. When this is all over, some families, some cities, will have suffered more from our interventions than from caps. No question there is a lot of suffering. 
Let me welcome Dr. Juan Perez to this discussion. Is Dr. Gamble wrong? Actually, in a way, we agree. Responders, whether international organizations, governments, or even employers and families, each are weighing risks and benefits. And there is not a one-size-fits-all approach as there are different appetites for risk. What I will say, in my mind, our response should aim to protect every life we can. Of course it should be. But let's be frank, letting the global economy slow to a halt puts lives at risk. Yes, yes, but there does need to be a balance. Okay, you both agree balance is paramount. Theoretically, that's an easy choice but leaders are now faced with very real and very tough decisions. Just last week, traditional sources for emergency funding had exceeded their limits. As new mechanisms are being discussed, there is consideration as whether funds should primarily support health emergency response or prop up economies. Precisely. And we do need these funds sooner rather than later. Funding shortfalls are putting lives at risk and extending this devastating crisis. Again, we seem to agree. We cannot shortchange the health response, but I suspect we disagree when I suggest that some of these funds are best used to save jobs and critical industries. National leaders certainly have this on top of their minds during the ongoing debates. Look, I am not an economist or a politician for that matter, but as a physician, I am comfortable saying that our health response to CAPS cannot afford to wait for an incredibly complex debate about what sounds to me like history's most expensive economic bailout. Thank you both, and we will be watching and listening for the outcome of these vital discussions. And certainly, the market is eagerly watching for any signs of hope. Okay, to go deeper on this, Dr. Eric Toner from our team is going to give details about the financial situation. Thank you. The economic impacts are being felt in all countries. In fact, losses are greater in the wealthier countries despite having fewer cases. This chart shows economic projections for global per capita GDP. If trends continue, preliminary modeling from leading economists suggests there could be an 11% decline in GDP at the one-year mark into the pandemic and a 25% fall in GDP at the two-year point when after the full effects of the pandemic are felt. There is significant uncertainty about how quickly GDP would recover, but economists fear that the pandemic could push the world into a prolonged period of significantly slower growth. Unlike recessions due to normal business cycles and market forces, a recession caused by a severe pandemic would be unprecedented in the modern age because of the huge loss of both workers and customers. The closest parallel, parallel may be the Great Depression, but the anticipated global recession due to the CAPS pandemic could be much deeper and it could take much longer to recover. There are a number of places where financial resources could be helpful in reducing the economic impact, including public health and medical response, helping national economies and supporting struggling businesses. But there are a lot of needs and there's not enough money to go around. Two organizations that provide loans regularly, the World Bank and IMF, would not have enough money to get us out of this crisis. The World Bank and IMF together disperse about $185 billion per year in funds. And they've already distributed a substantial portion of that money in this crisis. Experts estimate that it would take $400 billion just to bolster the overwhelmed healthcare systems in low to middle income countries, and alone just to uh, cope with the pandemic. To put this in perspective, the financial bailouts of Greece, Portugal, and Ireland following the European debt crisis amounted to approximately $350 billion, and that was only three countries. Without bailouts for national economies, economic failure in the most desperate countries could lead to a collapse of national governments, which could further exacerbate the CAPS pandemic. Of course, funds are still needed to support pandemic response. In addition, there are concerns that if some highly important companies or industries fail, there could be a domino effect that undermines the already faltering economy. Many countries in the greatest need of financial support have historically been labeled as risky investments due to a combination of economic, social, and political instability. They would be at even higher risk of default now. 
Very rough estimates are that collectively donors, countries, foundations, international organizations may have as much as $100 billion to lend or donate over the coming year in this crisis. The question is, what is the strategy for the don what should the strategy for the donors be? This will require a huge and unprecedented mobilization of funds from many different sources. Toner. So the policy question for this board now is how should financial resources be prioritized? Experts are discussing a number of options. The first option is to direct funds to public health and health care systems directly in countries that are struggling to, to keep those systems functioning in face of the pandemic. Another option would be to use funds for pandemic response to give to companies that are doing work directly related to the response, either in the making of vaccines or pharmaceuticals, medicines, N95 masks, or others directly involved in the response. A third priority would be to direct funds towards stabilizing governments that are beginning to falter in the face of pandemics. And yet another could be to direct funds towards industries or companies that might take down the global economy in some way, in some kind of domino effect, or in some way, companies that are too big to fail. So the question here is, are there nodes that we cannot allow to fail? What is your sense of priorities? We don't have money to pay for all of these urgent problems. Let me start. Jane. Um, we need to be really clear. Unless we bring this pandemic under control, um, at the end of the day, the question of the economy is redundant. So prioritizing what we need to spend, where we need to spend it, to actually get the public health interventions, and that includes the supply chain for PPE and pharmaceuticals, it seems to me is the thing we need to focus on. In truth, and I note the comment that the impact economically on developed countries has been greater than low to middle income countries, that is what has happened previously. This is not unusual. We accept that, and in truth, those developed economies, they do have still a capacity to borrow on the markets. And while some countries are very determined about uh, having surplus budgets, there are times when you dip into uh, your reserves and you uh, sometimes run a deficit. So I don't think we should be prioritising and stepping into the role that domestic governments, particularly where there are competent governments in place, uh, but we certainly should prioritise bringing the pandemic itself under control. And I agree, and I, I need to add from our constituency that um, you know, we, we need help. We need uh, public funding to be able to expand the capacity of our antiretrovirals. Without that, we cannot meet the demand. Okay. Other comments? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, I, I really think there are two questions here. Is one is how to find more money, and then how to best allocate mm -hmm. that money. And, and um, on finding more money, I go back to the suggestion of G20 finance ministers because I think it's, it's that perspective that's needed to understand where those pools are, both nationally and internationally. Um, David Malpass, the president of the World Bank, uh, makes a big point that there are $15 trillion sitting in zero or negative interest rate um, <coughs> settings at the moment. Um, the, those who are proprietaries, proprietors of those money might be interested in um, uh, using some of them um, if it's uh, half a trillion, that's a, a small portion of them, significant but small, but if that was going to stabilize or have the chance of stabilizing things such that there isn't uh, a massive uh, contraction of the global economy, then that might be a, a reasonable value proposition uh, to put to that group. Secondly, what are the contingency capabilities of national governments? And this is an area that we found um, is um, universally lacking, uh, which is that ability to surge finance. And, and uh, some countries, because they've been hit multiple times by crises, have developed surge capacity, but many still have no ability for surge capacity. So this would be another one where you could look at national efforts to, to mobilize resources. Again, as Jane said, uh, borrowing in the near term uh, may, may buffer in the, in the longer term. And then into the issue of allocation, I think that these are the right things, but I think we have a, um, an ability to draw, or would be better informed if we have evidence on where value for money is 
where are the investments that would actually make a difference? Because there is a bit of a problem in these settings, uh, which is uh, people see a gravy train, and everybody says they need a billion dollars. Uh, and then you look at the implementation capability of some of those institutions, or what it is they're doing, and is there real evidence to support that those things, in fact, would be um, value added? So I think some discipline with respect to where value for money might be got along those various axes would be helpful. And when you say value, you mean value to <coughs> what end? Value to the ending of the pandemic? That's right, okay. as one, or sustaining, um, sustaining the livelihoods, because you do have, I think, this, this tension is a healthy tension, right? If you, if you neglect the livelihoods, then it's going to come back and exacerbate um, the health crisis. So you'll have the indirect health crisis, which is what we saw in West Africa, that many more people were affected by the closure of health facilities and the shutdown of the economy and the falling of screens like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pandemic. <laughs> Part of the yeah. pandemic. Yes, George. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we already discussed about the coordination and centralized efforts. So we think about you know, the system in China. It's good for the public health, actually. So um, even a good example for the West um, African outbreak of two, uh, 2014 for the Ebola, and also the 2009 pandemic H101. So obviously, for when you centralize the fund from the government, you know, for example, so in China, we, are, we very quickly, we got enough fund for, to develop a new kind of uh, vaccine for H101. So with the 89 days, 89 days, we got a new vaccine available. I mean, for <coughs> two one, uh, the 2014 effort to West Af Africa. So I was in the team. So we went there with your, you know, one and a half month, we made a decision, we went there. So again, for all this, when you are talking about a prioritize the fund, definitely you need a centralized and coordinated effort. Otherwise, you know, the money will disperse somewhere. So you, you, could, you would envision a, some kind of centralized, centralized in the UN system, are you thinking? <laughs> no, I'm not saying the what system, kind of because system? We are, now we are, we, are in a, you know, we are in a risk for mm -hmm. pandemic, right? So I'm not seeing the centralized system, centralized the effort. You, okay. you, you have to a take, take my word. So at the moment, we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? So government can supply some money. A lot of you know, private sectors, you know, some are sitting here, you have some money. But now you need a really coordinated, centralized efforts. <coughs> the comments. Yeah, Toy. Um, and <coughs> piggybacking on to what he just said, um, hotels will be, will be experiencing, you know, crippling losses during that. And we know that the hotel business in itself makes up 5% of the GDP. And with that being said, we also have to make account for that when we're, when we're trying to increase funding and look for extra ways to financially um, commit to this endeavor that we're on to find a vaccine and to provide resources to you know, all of our constituents, so. Thank you, yeah, comments here. I think it's important to recognize <clears throat> that this really is an unprecedented situation and we need to be willing, governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective or for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on um, and massive mobilization of resources is appropriate to stem the tide of this of this event. So when you say things that they haven't been doing <laughs> in the past, you're talking about financial mobilization Correct. in this case? Okay, Brad? Uh, I wouldn't under, we shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. And um, 2008, we saw the GDP go, GDP go down about six and a half percent. I'm not trying to mitigate what the, what the crisis is happening here, but it's, it, we, can, we have time, uh, a little bit of time here. And so, um, the power of entrepreneurs coming um, right now, most of our per personal protection devices are manufactured in just a few countries. Um, they used to be manufactured in a much broader base around the world. That can happen fairly quickly. Um, we're already seeing 
Um, things move from different parts of the country to different parts of the world now, and, and we need to escalate that, whether it's through you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan mm -hmm. that can go into effect uh, can stimulate a change very quickly. Okay, thank you. A couple comments here and I'll come back. Yeah. I, I fully support Steve what he said. I mean, <laughs> it's a new dimension for everybody and we, we have to think out of the box, if I'm allowed to say it that easy. Uh, we have to use the international measures that we have, like the World Bank and the IMF, but we also have to be ready a national to, to deal with this. And Jane, I agree fully with you. The main focus should be to somehow get this pandemic under control. If we don't progress on this, what is left? after all, honestly to say, and speaking from my industry, I mean, reality in a situation like this, many of our competitors would have been gone for the time being. They will be on ground. They will not be able to continue mm -hmm. business. And also a major group like Lufthansa Group will be heavily affected and we depend on uh, governmental support now to be ready for a time after this. I mean, uh, we all hope we get through this and we have to be ready on limited resources to come back in the business uh, all around the globe with all our industries. So are, are the airline industries, would you consider them in some ways industries that we can't let fail? Some of them I would support. I mean, uh, otherwise the entire system breaks apart, falls apart. And uh, still in the period where we are in the high pandemic crisis situation, we still need transportation, we still need logistics uh, with other partners, and even for the time after this, there should be a basic service available, otherwise uh, we can't get back. Eduardo, did you want to comment? Well, I think, uh, I would like to think that we're too big to fail or let fail, uh, but uh, I do believe that you need to keep uh, the supply chains open for the containment and prevention and mm -hmm. amelioration. Uh, we are not, I believe, at the risk of the travel or hospitality industries because you still need that backbone uh, for logistics and supply chain. Levan, <coughs> yeah. Um, so I've, I've got information that um, uh, this too big to fail is now moving into the financial sector and uh, reinsurance companies in, in wherever they are operating might be in risk of bankruptcy. So the question then is, as a regulator or as a central bank, what then do we do? Uh, so the question here, I think, is about getting uh, the rest of the financial sector. So it's obvious that the stress test that we have implemented over the years hasn't worked very well. Or oh, this is a case which is really beyond what has been uh, expected. So for the ones that are failing, I think you need to step in because if you don't step in, then what's going to happen is you, you're probably going to get a systemic failure across the financial institutions. So we need to give confidence to the market. And, and you know, once the event is over, then to go back and review the models again. Can I just ask you to say what and what is the implication if the reinsurance companies aren't able to operate? Does that worry you? Yeah, definitely. You know, because um, uh, this is a global market. So if the one reinsurer falls in one country, what does it mean across the globe that it's occupying in? And one of the the issues here is then um, does that reinsurer pull back all its funds to the head office? Okay. And then the other countries then have an issue. Avril? Thanks. So I've been told that some governments have now fallen and that others are teetering and that there's widespread social unrest and governments are asking for emergency aid to stabilize their economies. And I think this highlights, from my perspective, there's the existing need for funding that relates to essentially the stabilization of government so that they can continue to provide services, which frankly, still contributes to the point that Jane made, which is that we need to prioritize bringing the pandemic under control. And if those governments fail, that will actually make it much harder for us to do that as we're moving forward. I think um, in addition to that, there's likely to be significant amount of um, other forms of security unrest, essentially, that can be concerning. And that can come in the form of, uh, you know, terrorist groups or others taking advantage of the situation, but it can also come in the form of you know, famines because of the fact that there are no longer people who are supposed to be providing food <clears throat> in the chain there because of you know, disease outbreaks in an area or things along those lines. And so I think there's a, a need to focus on assistance, humanitarian assistance, other types of assistance 
that can help to prevent sort of widespread death and destruction in certain areas where we see it and where it's actually gonna make it more challenging in particular to address the pandemic as it continues. But there's also the need from my perspective to be looking for the next few months. If we still mm -hmm. believe that a vaccine is not going to be available for many, many months to come, then we're gonna to continue to see a trajectory of an expansion of this. And, um, and as a consequence, we're gonna to wanna to be able to make sure that we actually have the infrastructure in place to deliver the kind of assistance that we need in these different areas across the board so that we can actually continue to manage the situation, not just economically, but political instability and violence that might outbreak as a consequence as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jane, and then we'll come right around here. My staff have <coughs> rightly reminded me that, uh, particularly depending on the kind of finance mechanisms that you put in place, there will be issues for particularly low to middle income countries, concerns based on history uh, about what that implies for those countries going forward. So I think um, the search for liquidity and the search for financing mechanisms that give people collectively confidence and acknowledging that uh, governments that are st uh, instable or uh, are politically vulnerable will find that even difficult to participate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. I do think the engagement of um, finance ministers and the big global mechanisms, but including the private sector and the banks, will be important. When we went through the GFC, it did require a very significant collective effort to maintain liquidity and to actually keep some of our big financial institutions afloat. <coughs> this would be the same. And if this is the rolling new normal, <coughs> sometimes delaying spread uh, so you can actually keep confidence <coughs> in your institutions mm -hmm. and keep your economy moving, albeit at a sluggish rate, mm -hmm. will be a really important part of uh, the agenda, I think. Sophia? Thank you, and uh, just an update that uh, UN leadership has uh, now put out a statement that it views the health and hum the, this pandemic as a health and uh, humanitarian crisis. And I note the point that Tim was uh, saying earlier about the healthy tension between lives and livelihood, um, and that it, uh, the UN agencies are now calling for uh, the establishment of a pandemic-related trust fund uh, and calling for contributions. I wanted to say that if we're now heading into the situation where governments are falling and you're having political instability, that if you end up then going into the other spectrum of conflict, then it, that's also going to compound the effects and also much more costly in, in the response. Chris? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, a couple of points to make. I think you know, this is gonna take unprecedented uh, effort to raise additional resources, but I think what resources we have have to prioritize public health. It's a little bit like first aid. You have to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. A month ago, we predicted there might be another million cases that came true. If these projections are true, there are 32 million cases in three months, the need for governments, industries, companies is gonna outstrip any possibility of our, our mobilizing the resources. We can't keep up with the shape of that curve, so we have to stop this pandemic. And that's where we put our first amount of money. What, what do we have to do to make sure we're doing everything we can to stop the growth of this pandemic? Then, assuming there's some resources left over, we have to think about who are our critical partners. And you know, our, the companies that will be our best partners of this are the companies who have been thinking about this ahead of time, who were prepared, who had redundancies in the, and plans for their, for their supply chains. They're gonna be our strongest partners. So we are gonna have to help work through public-private partnerships to support companies, but not all companies. The ones that are critical to sustaining that global supply chain, keeping commodities, people, food, um, other essential uh, uh, things to, to sustain the stability that we need to prevent governments from faltering, et cetera. So we're gonna need much more specific information and we're gonna need a lot of that information to come from the industry itself. And to, I think a complicating sorry. factor I think that oh, goes to advancing understanding in the public marketplace also is impacted by the fact that the investor community is not discerning properly from misinformation and disinformation. Um, and so to your point about public-private, it also is incumbent, I think, to ensure that everybody's advancing <coughs> genuine understanding of the spread of the epidemic and the efforts being made to mitigate it. Because the investment community needs to be a part of this as well in terms of their, the role they play in the financial markets. 
Tim okay. and then Hasti. Uh, two points. First, uh, our country directors at the World Bank are sort of reporting in that there's quite a bit of unethical activity with respect to tying emergency <coughs> loans on a bilateral basis to longer term conditions related to access to natural resources in low income countries, which could indeed compromise the economic viability of these countries moving forward. So there is an issue related to making sure that the emergency doesn't um, uh, facilitate uh, worst practice or unethical practice in terms of financing. Um, secondly, um, I think part of what uh, will s uh, stimulate the mobilization of resources, not only having a sense of the cost, but what the return on investment would be if we actually made it over this. And so I think one critical piece is we need to project out uh, recognizing various scenarios of, uh, of when we're going to get on top of this. The, the world's population is finite. Uh, we know it's, it's doubling uh, you know, at, at this rate, exponential. We'll get to global coverage of, uh, <laughs> of this soon enough uh, with a, some sense of cost scenario. And if we could project what a sufficient investment in best buys would get us in terms of uh, minimizing not only the cost going into this, but also the accelerated uptake of the uh, recovery, then I think that would be helpful in getting investor confidence. Is that something that World Bank could do, this kind of projection, or is that going to require... <clears throat> we we do this with uh, incredible scientific accuracy, to 0.001%. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, it is the sort of thing that the bank could do, um, and, and, and really fo focusing on projecting to that medium term um, set of outcomes where you can begin to look at the ROI. Hasti. I think as we talk about prioritization of funding, as someone who worked in a hospital before during, before, um, during the Ebola crisis, when so much of the funding for the hospitals go towards combating this specific disease, we can't forget that there are going to be mm -hmm. patients that are impacted by other diseases who would have otherwise lived, received the care they needed, they would be in the ICUs that they need to be in, and with those hospitals inundated with these specific patient cases, we can't forget to help them, first and foremost, to be able to stop not just this disease, but all the others that are impacting patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yeah. Adrian and then Steve. So, so I think, first of all, you know, if you think about Three, three broad buckets, perhaps. <clears throat> First of all, we have to accelerate shutting down this current outbreak. The second is we have to prioritize industries that allow us to bounce back. But there's the third piece, which is how we, there's 200 epidemics a year. So how many times can we continue to respond to an outbreak? So how are we prioritizing investments in preventing this from happening again, having a faster emergency response, having better data, having better systems to isolate, quarantine, and control? Steve? I think that there's a risk that we assume that our interventions are going to be more effective on the health side than they really will be. So I think there's a need really to be honest with ourselves about what we're able to accomplish. Um, having said that, um, I think that prioritizing resources to the health and public health response is going to be very important. And my staff tells me that those resources are running very low. That uh, prioritization is an important element in sustaining the trust of the population in the system that they're living under. And in a lot of ways, that has to be a, a high priority to try to track that and make sure that uh, public trust doesn't erode any further than it already has. Yeah, Tim. Very quickly on this point, I, I think um, the financial resource may be most limited by the human resource. And, and we I don't think we've moved far enough, fast enough um, um, in recognizing the need for a, a global surge capacity with respect to uh, multi-purpose workers um, uh, that could be deployed in this setting um, that are required, um, uh, uh, have the competencies and can plug into the system in ways that um, there's no way existing staff uh, could mm -hmm. manage all of the, all of the challenges. So I, I just think that uh, we really need to put some some serious thinking about what that surge workforce capacity looks like. What are the set of competencies? Where do they? Where can they get plugged in, and really be additional in a setting like this? So, uh, just to add, kind of a focus back on the the last question here as well. A number of people have talked about critical nodes or industries that we can't let fail, or that are critical to our survival through this, or an economic survival. <clears throat> Are there things that we haven't talked about that should be surfaced, nodes that we should 
I think to echo what he said, um, you look at Marriott International and you think hotels, but they are diversified in many different fields. Um, many people do not know that we have a whole healthcare team across the world that of, of nurses, doctors, and nurse practitioners. So when he says mobilization and uh, getting other healthcare providers to jump in to help with the situation, you can use private sector um, companies that are diversified in many different areas to help utilize and, you know, really get into the groundwork of what needs to be done to get this accomplished. Okay. Last moment for comments. Well, I think we should acknowledge that since the start of the pandemic, one of our members has succumbed to the disease. Um, and I note that uh, Dr. Chikwe, who was a very upstanding member of this committee, sadly is not with us today because he is fighting the disease. Thank you. Yes. So um, is there any priority that's on this list before we close? Any priority that we have not talked about that you think should be amongst those that should be receiving global priority for, for donors financing? The stabilize the faltering government. As I want to add uh, one more comment. Like Sophia said, you know, government is falling. We cannot afford a falling government. <laughs> <laughs> we can't make sure we need a strong <laughs> government here. This is a, you know, with a point we should address. And I, I agree with Timothy. We come to a status now where we have to stabilize the resources that we have anyway. Uh, if it really falls apart <coughs> in any sector, uh, we will have uh, resources all around the globe, but how to get them where we want them, how to work them together, how to exchange them. Uh, it's mm -hmm. beyond borders of companies, of countries, mm -hmm. in that status that we are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Final comment, Tim? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Avril? But, but something that I mentioned earlier, too, that's not up there, I think, which is basically um, ensuring that we actually have on the list of things that would receive mm -hmm. funding, infrastructure that would allow for both public and private sector help for humanitarian assistance that would then actually help to provide, um, uh, to address the challenges that are exacerbating the, uh, you know, the spread of the disease under certain circumstances. Got it. Yeah, real, real quick, I, it may be inherent in the prop up of industry, but uh, trade associations should be added to that. There's some really effective trade associations today, Haida being one of them, and it's bringing manufacturers and distributors together. Uh, Henry Schein's part of it, BD, Johnson Johnson, 3M, that are uh, very effective in, in, in coordinating, collabor in collaboration, um, and just should be. We should make sure we're enabling and, and empowering them. Okay, Tim. Very quickly, uh, it's not just about allocation; it's about accountability. If you get money out quickly, you've got to get re accounts in quickly. We still don't have that capacity, and without it, you don't have confidence the money's being well spent. And can I add one? And that is, notwithstanding the fact that everyone is very stretched, one of the things we always need to do is to learn from the circumstances that we're in. So, if we don't use this circumstance to collect data, actually do an analytical uh, sort of check, if you like, which for future circumstances we can then rely on in terms of preparedness, we will also be missing something we should be focused on. Okay. Chris, um, one, one other area, it's a modest amount of, of resource in, in the context, but also one of the things we've been doing since the start of this uh, pandemic is actually increasing some of our focus on, on the cutting edge science and research and development. Um, this is an unknown pathogen. We're, we live in a, in a period of, of amazing scientific discovery uh, that may not have been focused on coronavirus. So mm -hmm. we're putting some of our philanthropic resources into cutting edge research on getting countermeasures faster, trying to accelerate that one year to a vaccine, trying to reduce the cost because even though the numbers don't currently reflect it, given the pattern, we're gonna see lots of cases in some very poor countries. Mm -hmm. And so getting the cost of commodities down getting additional uh, manufacturing capability and trying to harness the cutting edge of science and technology may be helped in this pandemic. Thanks. And Steve, true last word. The, uh, what we're doing here is really a larger version of what we did in the last move. And I would hope that the systems that were put in place to determine how to share the medical resources would be able to operate at this level as well, that they'd be scalable. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all for this discussion. We'll bring these recommendations forward and we will close this meeting and reconvene as needed.
Okay, we will now advance three weeks to the fourth and final meeting of the Pandemic Emergency Board on December 18th, 2019. Okay, thank you for reconvening and let's get an update from Dr. Rivers. <laughs> In the last three weeks, case numbers have continued to grow exponentially. We now have an estimated 4.2 million cases and 240,000 deaths. Almost every country is now reporting cases and those who aren't may simply not have the resources to conduct surveillance. We don't see any change in the rate of rapid spread and models estimate that we could have more than 12 million cases and close to a million deaths by mid-January. We're not sure how big this could get, but there's no end in sight. Financial markets are universally down by 15% or more on the year. Fear of a catastrophic pandemic and uncertainty about the capacity for governments to respond and remain viable are fueling investor uncertainty. We have called this meeting today because of major strategic problems around communication that are happening globally. And here's a media debate that just happened on air today. Alarming news emerging from social media companies today about the CAPS pandemic. Twitter and Facebook are reporting they've identified and deleted a disturbing number of accounts dedicated to spreading disinformation about the outbreak. For more on this, we go to our correspondent, Catalina Parks. Chen, these accounts were created by several state-sponsored groups intending to sow political discord, and some individuals are seemingly seeking to gain financial advantages. Violence against healthcare workers and minority populations has been increasing. A recent riot highlights the real danger in these posts. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. Thank you, Catalina. For more on this, we are joined by experts on crisis communications and social media. Kevin McAleese and Sarah Lee. To me, it is clear countries need to make strong efforts to manage both mis- and disinformation. We know social media companies are working around the clock to combat these disinformation campaigns. The task of identifying every bad actor is immense. And experts agree that new disinformation campaigns are being generated every day. This is a huge problem that's going to keep us from ending the pandemic and might even lead to the fall of governments, as we saw in the Arab Spring. If the solution means controlling and reducing access to information, I think it's the right choice. I agree with Kevin. This is a big problem and doesn't even account for the massive amounts of misinformation being generated by legitimate users about the pandemic. But it's not just trolls who are spreading the fake news. It's often political leaders themselves. Who's to judge what's real or not? Would we trust every government to separate truth from lies? I think this is more than just keeping the bad information out. It's also about making sure real public health information reaches the public. News is found from outlets other than social media. News organizations, public health groups and companies need to help people take the right actions to protect themselves by promoting accurate, real information about the outbreak. Okay, for more on this, we're gonna get a briefing from our communications expert, Dr. Sell. Global health experts have highlighted that dis and misinformation are wreaking havoc on the CAPS response. Health workers are under attack in a number of locations due to rumors that they are purposely spreading the disease. And response efforts in many places have had to be suspended because of concerns around violence. Pharmaceutical companies are being accused of introducing the CAPS virus so they can make money on drugs and vaccines and have seen public faith in their products plummet. Unrest due to false rumors and divisive messaging is rising and is exacerbating, exacerbating spread of the disease as levels of trust fall and people stop cooperating with response efforts. This is a massive problem, one that threatens governments and trusted institutions. Polls have shown that mis- and disinformation are ubiquitous. At least 90% of the public has been exposed to these messages. At the same time, misinformation messages come from a variety of sources, even government officials. And often, governments are contradicting one another. We know that social media is now the primary way that many people get their news. So interruptions to these platforms could curb the spread of misinformation, but could also limit access to information from legitimate sources. 
health ministries around the world are attempting to combat mis- and disinformation by amplifying public health messaging through social and traditional media. But they are being outpaced by false and misleading information. National governments are considering or have already implemented a range of interventions to combat misinformation. Some governments have taken control of national access to the internet. Others are censoring websites and social media content. And a small number have shut down internet access completely to prevent the spread of misinformation. Penalties have been put in place for spreading harmful falsehoods, including arrests. Other countries have taken a more moderate approach and have focused on promoting fact-checking efforts and working with traditional media outlets, yet these approaches are limited in scope. Social media companies report that they're doing all they can to limit the use of their platforms for nefarious or misleading purposes. But this is a technically difficult problem, and false, misleading, or half-true information is difficult to sort without limiting potentially true messages. The bottom line is that members of the public no longer know who to trust. Both the misinformation and the measures to control it have led to a crisis of confidence. Thank you, Dr. Sell. So here's the policy crisis for this meeting of the board. How can governments, international businesses, international organizations ensure that reliable information is getting to the public and prevent highly damaging and false information to the extent that's possible about the pandemic from spreading and causing deepening crisis around the world? How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? And what if that false information is coming from companies or from governments? So your views would welcome. So I would start by pursuing where trust exists in the ecosystem. Uh, Jane, in a prior meeting, uh, mentioned that there's considerable trust by employees of their employer. And that's been borne out um, by our own trust barometer in, in the last several years, where there is, it's extraordinary the amount of trust given to the employer. And coupled with that, in times of crisis as we're living, the role of the CEO and the trust given to the CEO for advocacy and for uh, advancement of accurate information is considerable. I would marry the business leadership of the employer with business leadership organizations, such as the BRT and like enterprises around the globe, um, but I also think we're at a moment where the social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities <clears throat> to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information because to, try to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. So flood, flood, flood good zone. information. Okay, others, yeah, Jane. Yeah, so can, can I uh, agree with that? And my fact did come from the Edelman Trust Index, you'll be pleased to know, <coughs> um, but also borne out by the work I've done as a CEO in my time. Can I also add that I think there are real technology opportunities here. I, I personally do not believe that trying to shut things down in terms of information is either practical or desirable. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. But we also need to actually think about a technological answer to this. So there is work that's being done to actually create algorithms to sift through information on these kind of social media platforms. Um, and I know that uh, the Gates Foundation and others are funding organisations to work on things like this in order that people can actually have more confidence in the sources that they will use in any event. So okay. I think both are, are a detailed solution working with individuals, but then also thinking about technology is something we have to advance. Asti. So, uh, looping back into the trust barometer, last year in Davos it was released that 
trust in traditional media sources has grown while trust in social media sources has gone down specifically after the last elections in the United States. So I think one of the ways that we need to approach this is to make sure that we have the right representatives on traditional media networks in order to uh, portray our side of the story and make sure that there, there isn't um, misinformation. I agree with Jane that shutting down internet is only going to cause extra panic and extra anxiety. Um, in fact, that staff tells me places where internet access has been shut down, there's unrest growing. So uh, we're not only dealing with this specific situation, but really people not trusting their governments at this point. And so I think we really need to make sure, one, from a news perspective, that that information being, is b being disseminated correctly and that we have the right resources out there um, to provide this information. I also think that there is a good point in trusting in employees, in your employers. Um, there are lots of communications channels, for example, during the Ebola crisis at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, we had daily briefings with the CDC to tell us what the situation was. And because of those daily briefings, we used between the intranet, internal global communications, and town halls. Uh, we use those sources to be able to disseminate information and make sure that our employees knew exactly what was going on, coming straight from the source, whether it was from our um, CEO, our chief nursing officer, or others within the hospital. Okay, yeah, Tim and Chris, I, oh, sorry. No, I think a, a complementary uh, tactic too is to, to tap faith-based organizations <coughs> and civil society and other institutions to recruit them also to, to, to basically, almost at a grassroots level, continue to, to basically have the integrity of, of the information. So I just pick up on the daily briefings or twice daily briefings. Um, during H1N1, WHO filled the parking lot in Geneva <coughs> with the, the, the global press and provided them daily updates on what was happening. And I think that's, that's, that's a manifestation of flood, meaning you have to lead and lead regularly. And I think in the terms of the content is what we know and uh, point to where communications have actually been pretty good. I think we projected the exponential increase in this quite well, uh, and therefore there's legitimacy to what's mm -hmm. being communicated. Uh, and so be clear about what's being communicated that we know and that is right, but also be very clear about communicating what is absolutely wrong uh, and being clear about that. And then also being clear about uncertainty and that that's being managed. So I think in those three domains, it's very important not to, not to deny, <coughs> uh, but to speak to them very clearly in the context of a daily briefing from, in this case, I can't imagine any other institution than WHO uh, being the focal point. Martin and, and Chris, and then I'll come down this line. Thank you, I fully, fully agree that uh, this is pure crisis communication and crisis communication today, also social media is part of it. And just to limit or even, or even stop social media would create a huge damage. And uh, we should use it, we should uh, get it on our side, mm -hmm. we should work together with them and we should try to avoid this mis misinformation. And uh, another topic is, I mean, our, our industry, there are indications, meanwhile, that we are getting in this uh, social uh, conspiracy theory topic, that we are part of this conspiracy theory, that we are uh, supporting this, that uh, wealthy countries will spread out caps to, to poorer countries. And this is a clear, clearly thing of social media that could be directed via clear crisis communication and confirmed and regular updated information. So I also agree with Matthew, companies this uh, uh, responsibility that the CEO talks to the staff, that the CEO improves this information flow, and then we have a chance to get it channeled. So are, in this case, are governments, do you think governments are at the point where they need to require social media companies to operate in a certain way? I hear you saying social media companies should not be impaired. Yep. But are they, do they need to operate under different conditions? I think Matt alluded to that as well. Uh, yes, I would say that there, there are specific conditions now and you have to find a way to cooperate and to have to find solutions for this, okay. but not to hamper them. Okay, Chris? So I, I just wanna build on Ed's comment about the importance of civil society and faith-based communities. I think in, you know, in addition to employers, um, people trust their neighbors, trust their local community organizations. With three million cases in the Americas, you know that local communities around the countries have been responding, whether it's to manage daycare so people can stay in school um, or go to, go to work. So the, you know, while the social media can provide better quality information, I think actually local community organizations can help individuals understand how to filter out some of the noise and to act on the good, good information that's there. 
I think that's an important lesson that we've learned recently. We're learning as we speak in, in East Africa with the Ebola outbreak. If you don't have the community trust and engagement, you can't deliver even effective countermeasures, even when you have them. So I think the importance of local community, perhaps married to and as a filter for helping to discern the truth from the misinformation on the, on the technology platforms is going to be an important part of this response. Mm -hmm. Steve, Brad, and then we'll go down the table here. I, just two points. Um, first is that um, we have to recognize that we are all susceptible to misinformation based on our, our beliefs and experience. And I think with the social media platforms, there's an opportunity to understand um, who it is that's susceptible in what form to misinformation. So I think there's an opportunity to collect data from, the, from, from that uh, communication um, mechanism. The second thing is, with that um, ability, we can identify false information more quickly. We are actually uh, receiving reports about um, people trying treatments that are uh, purported to be effective but are actually harmful. And the quicker we, that's recognized and can be, be countered, the, the fewer people will fall susceptible to those things. Okay, thanks, Brad. Yeah, I don't want to be repetitive. I agree with almost everything that was said. But uh, when we talk about our health, who do we typically trust? Our physician. And we're not talking about that right now. So, I mean, we need the, uh, physicians and the medical community uh, really out there on the forefront talking about this. I remember I had access to local news in Atlanta when the patient was uh, taken care of uh, for Ebola that came back. And uh, physicians were on there nightly talking about, you know, don't panic. It's okay. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to go spread. So I would add physicians to those. Okay. Yeah. I've got some important news to share from our, um, our member companies. Rumors are actually spreading that the antivirals are causing gaps, and so um, patients are, are not taking them anymore. And, and uh, this is particularly an area where we have government mistrust. On the other hand, it's interesting because we are doing clinical trials in, in new antiretrovirals, and in fact, in vaccines, and social media, including Facebook, is actually enhancing recruitment. People are going to it, and they're actually seeking information on where they can participate and sign up. And so I sort of wonder that. Maybe we're in the mistake of reporting and counting all the fatalities and infections, and we're not sharing with people what are the wins. You know, who are the, who are the patient advocates that can say what worked for me, and maybe you should try that. I think we, we have an opportunity here. Okay, George. And then yeah. Gabriel. Um, I'm sorry. You go ahead. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, by now, you know, we have um, <coughs> more more cases in China and also death cases reported, and also uh, my staff told me. Uh, but before there's misinformation and uh, there's some belief, people believe, you know, this is a man-made, uh, some uh, pharmaceutical company made the virus. So there are some violations and even, you know, death is because of this misinformation. Um, as a, you know, from uh, like the CDC, and you know, I don't know if Steve, believe, uh, Steve agree with me, uh, when you are doing the field work and uh, you like to do some so-called TOT, training of trainers. So we really need to know, to train the health workers, especially health care workers, their access to the patients, to the public. So make sure they, they got the <coughs> right information. So not necessarily, you know, sometimes the health care workers, they know something, but they, if they are not well trained, they might give the wrong information, but also they might say something, oh, I don't know. You know even I don't know, that could hurt. So when I remember that's, uh, that's such a situation remind me when I was in Sierra Leone, you know, I was interviewed by radio, the national radio. I was asked by one of the audience to say, okay, we believe Ebola was man-made. It's transported from, you know, somewhere. So this is, I think this is very important. We do the TOT. So make sure the healthcare workers have the mm. right information. Okay, thank you. I very much agree with that. So, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what's been said. I just add to it maybe by saying that I think one of the things we want to do is work with telecommunication companies to actually ensure that everybody has access to the kind of communications that we're interested in providing because that's going to be critical for dealing with, uh, you know, obviously the explosion of the disease. And, um, and then another issue, I suppose, is, is just through that, if you have a trusted source, I believe in the idea that we shouldn't be trying to um, control communication, but rather flood the zone, in a sense, with a trusted source that then is <coughs> influential community leaders as well as health workers, as Brad noted, and others, 
on these issues in order to try to amplify the message that's coming through. And I think Tim's absolutely right. I certainly seen the value of communicating constantly on these issues so as to continue to, to deal with, uh, you know, sort of the vacuum that can be created in this circumstance. But then also with the comments made about the fact that for all of the disinformation that will be put out, it's gonna be important to actually have a response to those questions and to those concerns, as Stephen said. And, uh, and I understand from staff that actually there are also uh, intelligence sources identifying multiple foreign disinformation campaigns and so on. But it's all a part of a larger piece, which is to say that every time there is something that comes out that is in fact false information that is starting to actually hamper our ability to address the pandemic, then we need to be able to respond quickly to it. So I have a number of comments here. <clears throat> People want to react to what I've real just said. I see a couple of fingers just went up. Mm -hmm. Matt and Tim. I think <coughs> just to, to build a little bit on what Avril said is, is, I think as in previous conversations where we've talked about centralization around management of information or pu public health uh, needs, there needs to be a centralized response around the communications approach that then is cascaded to informed advocates, um, represented in the NGO communities, the medical professionals, et cetera. You but mean centralized internationally? But centralized on an international basis, um, because I think there needs to be a central repository of data, facts, and key messages. Tim, you wanted to comment on that, and then we'll go back to regular order here. Yeah, I, I think one important thing is it needs to, there needs to be a sense of two-way communication, mm -hmm. which is uh, people on the front lines may be finding out that actually the system's not working as it should. And I, I think there should be a, a culture in the communications to feed back um, to authorities places where the system is broken down, where supplies are <laughs> short, where there are no health workers, where hospitals are dysfunctional. Etc. Because that, and then with some credible investigation process, which is um, that then values the the, the client. The, the second dimension of it, I think, that's really important is uh, is to get individual narratives on this. I mean, the fact is that most people will survive, uh, and that's probably not a, a widespread public perception. And so, people who have lived and survived um, and can say that they got good care or that they were treated appropriately will help build confidence um, in, the, in the system in a way that perhaps the data doesn't do as effectively. Hosti, Latoya, Sophia, and then Jane. I think a couple of things we have to consider are, even before this began, the anti-vaccine movement was very strong. And this is something specifically through social media that has spread. So as we do the research to uh, come up with the right vaccines to help prevent the um, continuation of this. How do we get the right information out there? How do we communicate the right information to ensure that the public has trust in these vaccines that we're creating? Um, and secondly, uh, news organizations in some countries are right now um, under a lot of pressure from their governments to provide politically favorable news. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think about, you know, this isn't just the United States where we sometimes take the freedom of press for granted. There are countries where the news organizations are owned by the government and how are they um, disseminating information and what do we need to be thinking about? How do we communicate with those governments to ensure that um, misinformation and disinformation is not being spread? Thanks, uh, That goes along with her. You know, I've received information from my staff saying there's, um, they're confused about the different authoritarian um, public health messages that are coming out from all the different sectors, the countries, the states, and uh, different cities. And they were concerned about the differences what the World Health Organization is you know, saying versus what their government is saying and what the total consensus are. So with that being said, you know, looking at hotels from that perspective, we're in a bind in knowing how to proceed. I see, Sophia? Um, thank you. I wanted to, I mean, the discussion is focusing on mis and disinformation, but I think what's important to counter some of that is to actually put out information or good, good news stories of people who have actually beat the disease or uh, best practices in other parts of the world that is, is uh, delivering on um, results and sharing that. Um, but also I agree on the point on having a, a centralized source of information and a world body that could have uh, garnered the respect of everyone, and I think the WHO in this instance might be that uh, source of information. Um, and again, using the UN networks on the ground, in many of these countries um, has a UN presence through its resident coordinator systems, and uh, I think based on 
the Edelman Trust Barometer, the UN still enjoys uh, a lot of trust yes. <laughs> around the world. So it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's a good bet. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. So, so I, I just want to focus, if I could, for a second, on why we communicate, what the purpose of this communication is. So there seem to be several elements to this conversation, one of which is to get the facts, however you define them, out there. But let's be completely clear. We have known for many years that tobacco kills you if you consume it. It's a fact. <coughs> and it's a crapshoot whether you're going to be in the 50% proportion who's going to die very young. But we know this as a fact. There are some things we know that are widely held. Doesn't mean it always changes people's behaviour. So I think we should also focus in a conversation about communication, about what the purpose of that communication is, and think about what we know about incentivizing the kind of behaviors we want to see. I agree with Tim completely. It needs to be two-way. So governments and people who are organizing service delivery, um, businesses who are trying to operate in this environment, they can do that optimally. But we should also think in a communication sense, it's not just about handing people a piece of knowledge. It's also about how we incentivize them <coughs> to manage their behaviors, which in any communicable disease outbreak, behavior of one sort will minimize your chance of getting a disease versus behavior of another sort, which may maximize that chance. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I just wanna come back to the community. Uh, you know, judging from the statistics, we currently have uh, 4 million survivors. We may in a month have 11 million survivors. Assuming this is like other respiratory pathogens, they're now immune. And they, yeah. they live in the communities, almost by definition, that are affected. So can we turn the survivors into an effective community-based source of accurate information? They're going to be the least likely to be wanting to spread false information. They're going to be motivated by having survived this outbreak and known loved ones who are also affected. I think they could become a very effective force for intervention at the community level. Thanks. I'm going to turn to Levon. I just want to ask one other question as, to think about as Levon's commenting. We've talked a lot about misinformation and flooding good information. We've just started to talk a bit about disinformation and the strategy around that. And Avril or others, if, after Levon comments, if you have any additional thoughts about the particular approaches to disinformation that may be distinguished from misinformation. It'd be good to hear about those. Yeah. But Levant. Uh, yeah, so I've received a note to say that some bad actors are actually using social media to spread rumors about specific companies in order to profit from short selling. So, you know, along, of, along the lines of what we've been talking about, you know, uh, this is going to cause companies to come up now to get some of their screen time as well because they need to spread the, the correct information. But one thing we haven't spoken about, and I'm wondering whether it's time to talk about this, is uh, a step up from the part of the governments on enforcement actions against fake news, right? Some, some of us, uh, these new regulations that come in place about how we, we deal with fake news. And maybe this is a time for us to showcase some cases where we are able to to bring forward some bad actors and leave it before the courts to decide whether they have actually spread some fake news. So we have about three minutes left for this discussion. I just want to throw one more question out for your final thoughts on what if it is, as some people have raised, governments that are spreading misinformation either inadvertently or to some political advantage? How do we work around that with international organizations or business? Are there particular things that people haven't mentioned already that are worth talking about? But does anyone want to talk about either that or disinformation or other topics in the last couple of minutes? Sure. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. So, <coughs> I have a very quick one. So, I want to talk a touch a little bit about science. I want to follow Chris' uh, talk. You know, because that's a very good chance we have survivors. Because we have so many survivors, mm -hmm. the epidemic already for two months. We have all these modern technologies and the platforms. And it's time to think about it to, to try to isolate the human antibodies for this. Because this is the very serious pandemic, but we want also to see the future. That will help science-based information. Thanks. Thanks. Avril? Sure. I, if you have state-sponsored disinformation, there's obviously additional tools that you can bring to bear to try to address that situation, not the least of which is bringing together other countries to effectively you know, take action against them for the kind of campaigns that they're propagating. But it's, um, But generally, I mean, I would say the disinformation the line between disinformation and misinformation is not always an easy one to find. Mm -hmm. And the reality is 
the greatest uh, you know, way to impact it, in my experience, is not to let it sit. So in other words, find your trusted interlocutors that are capable of saying this is not acceptable, this is in fact the truth, here is the information. And I think the community of survivors is one example, but there's a whole series, employers, trusted faith leaders, variety of health workers, and so on can be part of that. In addition, obviously, you want to work with the private sector and those who are spreading information generally to see that they can bring things down that are, in fact, lies or uh, you know, false uh, information that's being put forward as a way to minimize it. But having a source, a national source, an international source, other trusted sources, and really guiding everybody towards that information is one of the most effective ways to deal with a situation like that. Great. I have Martin, Tim. Yeah. If, it, if it comes back to misinformation on a level of governments, of, of countries, then we need, as Sophia mentioned, trustable international organizations, <coughs> UN, WHO, and they have to come together to get together to spread this trust and to work against this. We cannot hold governments from doing misinformation on their own. So I fully uh, trust on these organizations. Tom, just to build on that, I, I think you're right. It's important that uh, the UN and WHO remain very clear. But when they challenge governments directly, they often get into this issue of, of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important not to have that as the only response. I think it's really critical to think about soft uh, uh, power influence, uh, which is other um, influentials who can call up the head of state. Uh, or um, powerful constituencies within those countries. Uh, we've seen this in the context of mobilizing religious leaders in the context of polio, uh, uh, or specific business leaders where you can soften perhaps uh, a very hard line mm -hmm. from government um, through um, less, more stealth um, uh, um, in, in entry points rather than uh, trying to punish them through the international health mm -hmm. regulations or something like that. Great, and I, Adrian, I think last comment. I think it's important to think about what atypical players in the private sector can we bring to bear in this. So bringing multinational pharmaceutical companies to talk about why, who are self-interested about why their products are safe could be seen as non credible. But if I think about examples, you know, the champion for TB in South Africa is Nando's Chicken. And so I think as we think about these large atypical players who have no credible vested interest in, in this issue but have a strong voice that's economically differentiated for their governments as well in their country, they're going to listen to them with some respect, I think will be very important. Okay, we're going to have to leave that conversation there. Thank you all for another very highly valuable discussion. We'll take what you've advised, bring it to the attention of leaders, and we deeply appreciate all you have done here in these meetings. This is concluded. Great, so that concludes the exercise portion of the event. Um, how did this pandemic turn out? We please watch this epilogue video and you can see the outcome. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. At first, wealthy countries with advanced health care and public health systems were primarily able to limit the spread of the disease within their borders. As systems became overwhelmed, however, no countries were able to control its spread. And the disease affected people of all socioeconomic status, from the very poor to the extremely rich, from sanitation workers to CEOs and national leaders. The economic consequences were dramatic. The high death toll and even greater numbers of sick hurt productivity in many industries. Manufacturers were having trouble filling orders, and countless companies in the service sector simply shut down. The global economy was in a free fall. The GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing. Banks were not lending. Everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. While nearly all businesses were affected, certain sectors were especially hard hit. Travel, finance, service, manufacturing, healthcare, and insurance among them. 
with some major companies going bankrupt. And there were seismic societal consequences as well. The world saw large-scale protests and, in some places, riots. People were angry about the lack of access to health care and medicine, as well as government's inability to protect them from the disease. This led to violent crackdowns in some countries and even martial law. Political upheaval became the rule across the globe. The public lost trust in their respective administrations. Several governments fell, while others were desperately striving to hold on to power. This spurred further crackdowns. Attempts to control media messaging, originally aimed only at health-related misinformation, became used increasingly to quash political dissent. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to ten years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we, as a global community, now finally ready to do the hard work needed to prepare for the next pandemic? So as you can see, the CAPS pandemic was catastrophic. And as we've said, the impact of a severe pandemic is not only a result of the disease itself, but really the cascading economic and societal consequences that would follow. Now, we don't want to give you the impression that traditional public health measures aren't valuable, because they absolutely are. In fact, in the 200-some outbreaks that WHO responds to each year, Interventions such as isolation of the sick, social distancing, disease surveillance, um, really do help to interrupt the spread of disease and control epidemics before they become pandemics. But in a severe, fast-moving pandemic, it may not be possible to contain the spread through these kinds of traditional measures. And as we saw in the scenario, it, there's a limit to what government, NGOs, and global business can do on the fly to stop a widespread and lethal pandemic. That's why prior planning and promotion of routine public-private cooperation in advance of the next pandemic is really critical. So we dealt with four, you dealt with four, serious international policy challenges today, but in an actual pandemic, there would be many more. In the exercise, the board wrestled with a series of very difficult problems, and you did a terrific job with no ability to prepare and a really fast-paced and complex set of issues. But assuming we do have a few years to prepare, what should we do to prevent this from becoming a reality? In advance of the exercise today, we drafted a, set, a list of actions that we think would start to move us in the right direction. And now that you participated in the exercise, we really want to seek your input on other things we could do to be better prepared. Our initial suggestions are these. First, global business should recognize the economic burden of pandemics and really fight for stronger preparedness. Business leaders and their shareholders could actively engage with governments and advocate for increased resources for pandemic preparedness. Second, governments and businesses should plan now for how corporate capabilities could be used for a large-scale pandemic. Industry assets, if swiftly and appropriately deployed, really could help to save lives and reduce economic losses. So governments could work now to identify the most critical areas of need and reach out to industry players with the goal of finalizing agreements in advance of a large pandemic. Third, we think industry and national governments should work with WHO to enhance internationally held stockpiles of MCMs and personal protective equipment um, in, in, so that it could be equitably distributed during a large pandemic. The WHO's existing influenza vaccine virtual stockpile is a good model that could be expanded and augment WHO's ability to distribute vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, other PPE to countries in the greatest need. Countries that would have to support this effort through the provision of additional funding to WHO. 
Fourth, countries and global transportation companies, we believe, should work together to maintain travel and trade during a severe pandemic. I think you all agreed that travel and trade are essential to the global economy as well as to national and local economies, and they need to be maintained. But public-private cooperation is necessary in order to explore potential solutions to that really difficult problem. Fifth, governments should provide more resources and support for the development of surge manufacturing of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Countries may need population level supplies um, of safe and effective MCMs in a pandemic. So we're therefore really going to have the need to rapidly develop, manufacture, distribute, and dispense large quantities of MCMs. Countries with enough resources should make this more of a priority than they do today. Sixth, we should increase and reassess pandemic financial support. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, regional development banks, national governments, and foundations should explore ways to increase the availability of funds in a pandemic and ensure that they could be flexibly used when they're needed. And finally, governments in the private sector should assign a greater priority to developing methods to combat mis- and disinformation related to pandemic response. Governments will need to partner with traditional and social media to, to, in order to research and develop nimble approaches to countering misinformation. For their part, media companies, we believe, should commit to ensuring that authoritative messages are prioritized and, and really false messages are suppressed. So those were our initial thoughts, and we'd love your ideas of what else should be on this list. So we have asked Jean Meserve, formerly of CNN and ABC News, who anchored that final epilogue video, to moderate a discussion now and solicit your ideas. Jean? So first, I want to ask you for your reactions to these proposals that have been put on the table and also ask you, do you have some additional action steps that you think could and perhaps should be taken? Yes, please go ahead. There we go. I agree with all of these. Uh, but I think there are other things that can and should be done. If Mike Ryan were here, the gentleman we saw at the outset, he would tell us that the mechanisms to actually do the prevention work, um, that's very hard to actually get enough funding for that around the world. And if I similarly look, so I chair a body called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, we are investing in the development of vaccines in the neglected um, and space. For example, MERS vaccines of this kind, the coronavirus. Uh, we do not invest enough as a globe in even having the basic options that we could scale up for manufacture, and that's both in the vaccine space, but also in also diagnostics, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think um, putting on this list the financing of both preparedness in a number of countries, but also uh, the technology preparedness, particularly in the vaccines, et cetera, would be a welcome addition to the list. Any thoughts from among you on how to increase that funding? Yes. Yeah, can I support Jane so, yeah, <laughs> and by see something about what I said about a science-based you know, information uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, we are living in the 21st century, so we need to build up the capacity and the facilities, make sure, you know, for example, today the event we discussed about tumor, the epidemic or the tumor. Say we have a half year epidemic. I think, think about Zima plague, uh, during, uh, during 2014, um, Ebola outbreak in um, West Africa. Though we are, what we are talking about is caps, it's a new virus, and uh, all the vaccine, all the uh, available uh, antibiotic wouldn't work. But give you <coughs> half a year or two months, we are ready. If you have the capacity and the facility, we are ready to produce from the survivor for some monoclonal antibodies. While you have ZMAP-like antibodies, or antivirus, I think you will restore the confidence of the uh, public. So this is our stress. We put that one to see, unite together under the WHO, put for some pharmaceutical companies to have the capacity or you know, facility to get prepared for monoclonal antibody producing. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, 
Um, yeah, so, so first of all, um, I think we should, uh, in the uh, spirit of uh, accountability, assess the effectiveness of this board. And, <laughs> and, uh, and as an you optimist, I'd like to say that, uh, that uh, we uh, take full responsibility for the, it's not meach, uh, reaching 100 million deaths or 200 million deaths. It was only 65 million, so there was some effectiveness of the board. Uh, but that, I think the question um, uh, more seriously is, is um, what sort of coordination do we have? Um, and I didn't see, uh, I, I saw collaboration and things that should be done, but I think in the, when the rubber hits the road, um, if you don't have well-established standalone coordination mechanisms that bring the right players to get together to make decisions on how best to respond across a sector, course, then uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be, um, we will not achieve the collective efficiency that I think many of us would hope that a, stimula a, a simulation exercise would. So any ideas on how to do that? How do we centralize that information in order to get situational awareness, set the priorities, uh, establish the communications protocols? So I, I, I don't, I, I would just say I'm missing here, and it may be that, you know, you don't want to recommend what you're doing, but I think we need a series of uh, simulations which get us much more refined in terms of working with the different dimensions of uh, the response that have to be mobilized in a fast-moving pandemic, and then develop a set of standard operating procedures that could be agreed uh, around with, with designated leadership uh, which could then be drawn upon uh, should we reach um, or enter into a fast-moving pandemic. So more, more of this. So just to agree with, uh, agree with these recommended actions and with uh, Tim that we should do more simulations, I think particularly doing them in places where decisions will get made um, locally at local public health authorities. I think particularly in urban areas, as we saw in this, it spread quickly in mega cities first. And I think in, as it spread to other regions, some of the regional economic <coughs> communities in East and Southern Africa, West, uh, West Africa, um, I think those simulations will be important with the people who will actually be making those decisions. But I wanted to build on, on Jane's comment about the research and development enterprise, because I think it highlights another gap. Uh, <coughs> I do think we need to put more financing into things like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. <coughs> Um, to, to prepare as, as their strategy is for things we can predict, um, MERS, other, um, Ebola, other things that we know are coming, NEPA. But I think, like we saw in this scenario, th there will be emergence of pathogens we can't predict. So disease we have to really X. work at you know, disease X, disease. They, um, or CAPS. Um, you know, platforms that can be rapidly mobilized using reverse vaccinology. I think we have to go beyond vaccines to yep. other countermeasures, yep. diagnostics, et cetera. Yep. And there, one of the stumbling blocks has been, uh, and I think George was getting at this, the rapid sharing of information, particularly gene sequencing information. Mm -hmm. Often countries are reluctant to share samples or sequence information mm. because they're concerned about the distributive justice. If we contribute to the science, will we benefit from the science? And I think, as Mike referred to in the opening video, we have some, a partial solution for that in the pandemic influenza uh, area through the PIP, but we need to expand that to other potential pathogens so that in the event of a fast-moving pandemic, countries don't hesitate to share the information that will be vital for science to do its job and develop countermeasures because, and they won't hesitate because they'll know they'll also benefit. Mm. And that regime doesn't exist yet. And whether we approach it through the World Health Assembly, tag, you know, build on the international health regulations, we need to have that in place ahead of time because establishing that kind of trust in the face of a fast moving pandemic is even harder to do. And, and just to add to that, to be completely clear, it took us years to negotiate the PIP framework. I actually chaired the Intergovernmental Working Relationship uh, meeting that did that. And that was when one country lost confidence in the global virus sharing mechanism, chose not to share, and it took us years to rebuild that trust and that confidence. And I would argue it's not completely there yet. Just I'd like, like, like to observe that there's, oh, a, there's a convergence of the two ideas that we've just heard. I think if there's confidence among countries 
that the governance and the sharing exists and that it can be relied upon, there'll be a greater willingness to share mm -hmm. samples and information. Mm -hmm. So I think those, those two things really fit exactly. together. And we just, we just keep, we, we have to keep the awareness alive and it's our responsibility to do this and uh, to do simulations, to do actions, to recommend actions like this. But I know exactly what happens when I go home to Zurich and when I talk about this next week in my company. They will tell me, yes, we know, but there are all the daily businesses to do. And I think we have to keep this alive. We all know that there is Ebola right now and we all know that there is a risk that it spreads out. We all know that there will be a next virus. But let's face it, we have to keep the awareness up, we have to talk about it, we have to get ready in due time, we have to set up platforms to exchange our information in due time, and that's the way how we can convince the companies, the leaders, and the organizations about this need. Yeah, just an observation. I mean, all of us here are from large companies, but you know, in an increasingly globalized world, how do we bring the small and medium-sized enterprises along with us? And I think maybe we didn't speak about that enough today. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you are only as strong as your weakest link. Um, and so, you know, some of these things that we talked about, like business continuity plans, how do you build capacity in small and medium-sized enterprises that they need to have some of these plans? And I think, you know, to your question, uh, financing is definitely going to be an issue, right? Because you need to set aside resources. And this is where I think something we, we spoke about might come to play. It's probably a PPP type framework where the government works with the industry associations and the companies to set aside some fundings to make sure that everyone has some of these basic plans in place. Yeah, I'd like to follow on from that. I mean, I think there are a number of good examples of collaborative sort of forums like the WEF, like the Private Sector Roundtable for GHSA and so on. But, you know, there's this notion that the private sector should get behind something and develop solutions for things that aren't here in the absence of real committed resources, number one, from the public sector or others, and number two, with, without really having any form of formal decision-making contribution. And I think that's an important one because, for example, you know, we may be a large company, um, so we're working on Ebola, we're working on the HIV vaccine, you know, we're working on tuberculosis, we're doing stuff in Zika and dengue fever, but there's a limit, and that's an opportunity cost that in non-commercial um, applications, Humanitarian, sure, economically important, sure. There's a huge opportunity cost of pursuing that that many other companies can't take. And yet if you look at the interaction scientifically with organizations like the UNWHO, then it's like, you know, non-state actors, stay out. And so if, if you're asking the private sector to get together to commit, which I think they would, by the way, then, you know, the value of that investment and the likelihood that it's going to end up anywhere meaningful has to be addressed at, at some level. Otherwise, why would we take the opportunity cost? Any idea how to do that? Yeah, estab establish a, a, a true cross-sectoral body that actually develops, develops guidelines, thinks about mechanisms, talks about these broader issues together, and actually allow, allow um, not single companies, but industry bodies to have some kind of input and voting rights into that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's, it's like the common good theory, and it's all very well, but we all have to go back to our companies on. Monday. Mm -hmm. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I want to build on this because uh, what I worry about is that uh, these last two comments, which is uh, everybody gets excited around a table like this in the moment, and then you, you, you move on, and it's back to business as usual. And it's this panic and neglect problem that we have, uh, which is very difficult to prospectively uh, develop uh, real preparedness. So I think there should be somewhere, maybe it's out of the GPMB, and, and a number of people here are uh, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, there should be a, a time-bound plan uh, with uh, uh, very clear targets with respect to what would constitute um, a new level of global preparedness. And we should look at what's required to get that financed in such a way that it's not purely, you know, uh, the goodwill of everybody coming together occasionally because they're at Davos or they're in New York, uh, but uh, that it, it, it has some real accountability to agents that um, are, lie behind or are, 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 are advocating for stronger global governance, but a practical one. It's not that WHO will do everything. It's that the various constituencies that have to be mobilized 
have identified what I would call SOPs on how to move forward in discrete areas that we know are going to be critical in moving this agenda so that we're not in the next um, outbreak saying, geez, we should have done this, and only if we'd done that, well, let's do more learning, you know, after, after learning to do. A little late at that point, Matt Harry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I share the concern about how to maintain sustained interest, let alone a sense of urgency around what would appear to be an inevitable. Um, and the thought, one thought I have is, you know, to the point of, do we create a moment in time that we work toward? And the analogy or the analog to that would, for me, be Y2K. Public private sector understood that there was a definitive moment at midnight um, in 2000 that we, that people had to address the situation and prepare accordingly. And even if it didn't redound to the individual in many instances, that laddered up to or larger organizations. And I think, again, to a point I made earlier about the absence of technology at this table, the lessons learned from how that sector advanced um, both awareness and remediation is something that could be brought to this conversation. Can, can I just point counsel, can, can I just make one comment about Y2K? Um, when I was trying to advocate inside government in relation to the potential threat from H5N1 that was endemic in Indonesia, I was actually told by an extremely senior person who I will not name that actually I was basically just on about Y2K with feathers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So could I just advocate for finding some other point in time reference? Okay. I, which I had to come up with in that circumstance. So I just share that. Yeah, no. <laughs> one, one of the threads that I pulled from the conversation around the table today was the lack of data. Um, that you don't have enough data to really have situational awareness uh, when an outbreak begins, that you don't know where the resources are, you don't know how to move them and where to move them. In this world where there is an abundance of data, is there a way to better coordinate between the public and private mm -hmm. sectors in order to capitalize on that data to learn more and learn it faster and move faster? I think you've, you've hit on a couple of points that are really important. In an event like this, moving or having a scale of operation larger than we've done for a health event is going to be very important. So it's really outside of the bounds of experience. The other, um, the other element is to move, be able to move quickly and at a speed necessary. I think that the, um, the opportunity to develop those kinds of mechanisms would be the kind of governance system that we're talking about, that that, that could be part of the agenda for a preparedness activity at a, at a, at a governmental scale. Um, the other thing I would, I would just comment is that um, an event like this is going to be outside of the health sphere, and so it'll be really important that this not be seen as a health event, but really yeah. as, a, as, a, as a global crisis, yeah. and that those parts of government outside of health that are going to be in the lead are leading in this, uh, this preparedness work as well. Any other thoughts on the data piece? Go ahead. Uh, well, um, yeah, I think the data is critical, but I, um, I'll use that to segue to another area, if I may, um, but, uh, which is uh, the human resource. And a key actor, uh, given that I now uh, have moved to academia, uh, but it is the academic or the training sector. Um, because if we're really going to develop a surge capacity uh, for something like this, where you're going to have to bring in the, the reserves, the global health reserves in some respect, um, it requires an incredible uh, um, coordination across training institutions, uh, both in terms of pre-service and deployment how people keep up skills that would be relevant. And uh, that plan uh, won't emerge from global businesses and governments collaborating. Uh, it's really got to bring in the higher education sector much more fundamentally, and I would argue with National Public Health Institute. I wanted to follow up on the trusted voice idea. Yeah. Um, I think everyone around the table spoke about how important it is to find those voices. Do we need to find them now? and establish trust in those voices now so that when the crisis hits, people already have the established trust. Thoughts? I mean, I would say without question, and because you're in a better position to build up that bank of goodwill, 
um, in advance of a crisis. And I'm, I'm very intrigued and I think very um, heartened by the conversation about the identification of community and faith-based leaders in particular, um, because they do foster enormous trust at a local level. And that but there are people who, amplify. at this point, probably know very little about pandemic preparedness. And hence education is necessary. In advance? Yes. I think newsrooms in particular, there's a reason why they have um, people <coughs> on the staff, actual former physicians and things, that are constantly talking about different uh, diseases or illnesses that are coming up so that they continue to build that trust so that th when there is a situation like this, there is already somebody on staff from the medical, a medical professional that's a trusted voice, whether it's on any of the networks, um, that's able to speak up. Yeah, we, uh, actually, you made a point earlier about the anti-vaccine movement that's been, uh, going forward right now. And, there was going to be a community event tomorrow in New York City um, that actually was ended up being canceled yesterday uh, because it was only anti-vaccine um, advocates as a part of a community event. And nobody from the professional medical community would join even in the conversation. Um, so the organizers ultimately, because they were shamed into that imbalance, uh, canceled the event. But it does call out that that's a real issue at the moment that needs to be addressed um, and should probably serve as a, a beta, if you will, for this a kind of a moment. Sorry, on this issue of trust, I, I, I think there's uh, something that's specific with respect to pandemics, but I think if we look at DRC at the moment, the distrust mm -hmm. relates to the health system mm -hmm. more generally. Uh, we didn't detect the first case in this 10th outbreak for three months because health workers were on strike because they weren't being paid. And so I think this community needs to pay particular attention to uh, um, uh, health systems that have very low levels of public trust because they uh, then, if you don't have that as a foundation, mm -hmm. you're not going to gain it in the context, or it's very difficult to gain in the context of an outbreak. Mm. Go ahead, yeah. Um, in similar lines, maybe, but uh, in the spirit of kind of learning from history, in, in 1918, 16 million people died. That was more than the two great wars. And one of the impending results was a massive shortage of physicians, care providers. So I don't see that on the list. I don't have any solution. If you ask me what do we do about it, that would be a subcommittee of this wonderful <laughs> committee, which I'm only a guest of, so I'm not taking credit <laughs> for it. But, but um, the shortage of physicians is looming anyway in the United States. I don't know about the broader world, um, but that's something should be considered in this. And the uh, second point I would only make is that uh, if it really were catastrophic, I don't know if we're prepared for the civil unrest that could uh, result in it. And we haven't really talked much about our, our, our public safety um, uh, vehicles, uh, not just public safety avenues ready, um, including military. Are they ready for such um, civil unrest if it were really to get out of hand? I don't see those in the recommended actions. That's all. I'd love to get down to the surprises and the big takeaways. Um, and I'd love to, if you guys are willing to do a round the table thing and get everybody's input on what they learned here and if anything, shock them. Um, April, can we start with you? Sure, I can. I should take a few minutes to think about that. Um, I do think that, I think that generally, and this comes out of our conversation that we've just been having, um, the areas that it seems to me require enlightened leadership in a sense is the issue of funding, right? And actually attracting greater funding to this issue. We all know that by spending money on preparedness now, we can save money later. And the fact that we don't have the mechanisms in place that allow us to more effectively address a crisis in the moment is critically attached to that. It does seem to me another piece of this is the, from my perspective, um, you know, it's not a surprise, but it's certainly a takeaway from the discussion is the need for greater communication mechanisms between the private sector and the public sector and the healthcare sector in actually trying to manage uh, a situation and to best leverage each other's essentially resources under the circumstances. And I think that's a, a critical aspect of what has to happen and one that frankly, the current system isn't well positioned to do because we're, we frequently work through the public sector and we have a variety of challenges in creating those sort of private sector and other industry uh, you know, connections 
um, to what we're doing. Another piece of it that really didn't come up in the discussion, but from my perspective is another aspect of it, and there's far more <coughs> experience and knowledge about health, public health issues in this room than, than I have, but it's, um, but those frontline health workers, I mean, the World Health Organization has talked about the enormous shortfall and that fact that they are utterly critical to identifying, detecting, and allowing for a response very quickly. And that's, you know, sort of at the key, the, if we can do that quickly, then we can get to a possible answer, a vaccine, other countermeasures that need to be brought in uh, more quickly. And so that's fundamental. And if we're able to establish communication networks that, you know, as, as Tim mentioned, go both ways to allow us to both take advantage of, uh, you know, the opportunity to communicate outwards, but also to take advantage of the opportunity to hear from those frontline healthcare workers. We're gonna be more effective, but we do need to train them so that they're actually capable of identifying the symptoms and issues that we should be responding to and developing those triggers. And I think that, that larger piece is the, you know, sort of <laughs> the most important part of it is if you can actually create the preparedness systems then you actually have a plan that triggers the investment that you need at the time that you need it and the communication that you need. Time is going short. Sorry, quickly. Okay, um, you know, I, you know, just through this um, table discussion, I've been in many, many previous <coughs> meetings already, you know, response or whatever meeting. So I would follow Adrian's comments. Uh, you know, financially or, or you know, whatsoever, um, cross-sectoral coordination, I already mentioned from the very beginning. So we, we have a meetings and meetings and discussions, but how would we either private, or governmental, or you know, political, or diplomatic, or also including data sharing, how would we have a co kind of a coordinated effort and cross-sectoral coordinated effort? I, I, we, still have a, we still haven't got an answer for that. So that's the key. Okay, and there are a lot of barriers. Jane. Um, <coughs> it takes a lot to shock me, so I can't say anything shocked me. I think what this has reinforced, though, to me, is there, is there is an absence of a centre to convene what is something that is broader than just a health issue. Um, it's reinforced for me uh, the fatigue problem. Uh, the truth is more people did die in the 1918 pandemic than died in World War I and World War II combined. And yet we talk about that all the time and we don't talk about the pandemic. 25% of people in Samoa died because people allowed off a ship. So that, those impacts are not talked about anymore. And then I guess the other thing that it's reinforced to me is how much more work there is to do on this issue, particularly from, if I can describe it in this way, a more ecosystem perspective. So it's not just from the health perspective, it's not just from the perspective of private injury, it's not just perspective of government, it's from the entire ecosystem. I think this is a really technical argument and it's a bit like, honestly, it's a bit like uh, when's the next asteroid gonna hit us? And I think people get lost in that. And if, if, you, if you wanna take this into something that's really actionable, you have to get down to you know, the consumer level, the, the, the person who doesn't live in West Africa waiting for Ebola, but the person who actually like I do, lives in New Hope, Pennsylvania, and doesn't see it. Until, until you get to that level, then you're not gonna get the traction and the actionability behind it. Like, what would I do different on Monday? You know, it, it's kind of a question for people living, not living right now in West Africa. So I think, for me, the big aha about this is, <coughs> it's, it's not bad, but it's a technical discussion with technical people who are involved in this every day, and to the exclusion of the community, I'd say. Uh, I'm struck by how probably this is, um, the broader public is unaware of just how severe this could be. That strikes me, and I would, I would share that I think um, an increase of knowledge on that, which could hopefully lead to more prevention and wellness in our healthcare system rather than the acuity that we deal with, at least in the United States, more, more uh, focus on prevention and wellness and, and um, specifically primary care, oral care, which has a direct um, correlation with you know, overall health and that helps immunity system. So I'm, I'm really struck by that. Uh, Mostly. I think it's very important to not be shocked. I think if when we're shocked, we're not able to make decisions to do the right thing. And I think some of what we've done today is just help us think through what's, what, a, what a really bad scenario might look like. Um, before an event like this, having the systems in place to coordinate more effectively is, is essential. In the long term, um, biotechnology and, as Chris said, the ability to rapidly develop a specific countermeasure 
is important. The, the requirements there are incredibly difficult. Within weeks, have something that everybody could, could take. Um, I'd say in the response, um, it will be really important to think about what the aim of the response is and how much can actually be accomplished. I actually think in this event, um, given what we heard up through the first moves, the outcome was really not as bad as it might have been. And I think we need to, as we're, as we're responding to this, we need to be uh, clear about what is achievable with the interventions that we have and not overestimate the impact we can have. Chris? I, I guess I'm, my surprise, uh, not shock, but surprise is the, the presumption of competence of, of the system. Um, I, one of the things that struck me <laughs> you in, the, in, the, uh, in the earliest video um, was that the poll showed that two thirds, I think it was, of the population uh, thought a vaccine would be available in two months. This is a population that is, at least in my state, a significant minority of people willing to question the, whether they should give the kids the vaccines we have today that have been around for decades, proven to be safe and effective. And yet in the face of a crisis, two thirds of them presume that the scientific mm -hmm. community will come up with a vaccine within two months. That's dangerous, magical thinking. <laughs> and uh, we have to you know, get a better set of messages out about what what the threat is and what could be happening. I think there's a, an implicit presumed competence of governments in the UN system that's probably greater than it should be as well. I think governments being clear about what they can do and what they can't Cannot. do in the face of an epidemic mm -hmm. will help in, in, in increase individual and community preparedness. Yeah, don't overpromise. Sophia? Thank you. Um, I, I mean, for me, this really exposed the vulnerabilities um, not around the room, but um, in terms of the country uh, comparisons. And those vulnerabilities already exist in the poorer countries. And um, so how are we going to st strengthen those capabilities, whether through the health sector or governments? And uh, these solutions uh, that we've been talking, the discussion for me has been sectoral, and we need to figure out a way. I'm not saying that the United Nations has the, the answer to all of this, but we need to figure out a way that can bring all stakeholders to the table in a situation like this to be able to bring the best uh, solutions to private to sector as well as government to yeah. Tim. Great. Uh, well, I, I, I'm uh, convinced increasingly that uh, simulations are stimulating and uh, <laughs> uh, I think they have a real value. And so I, I want to make sure that that gets added to the list of recommended actions. Uh, I think um, we have to look um, and complement that stimulation with a much clearer commitment to driving uh, change in behavior in a very complex system in specific areas. And I think this is helpful, but if we lay this on the four reports that were produced uh, following the West Africa crisis, if we link it into the ongoing activities of the Global Panda uh, Preparedness Monitoring Board, um, I think we would come up with a uh, uh, an ambitious agenda, but one that gets sufficiently refined that we can begin to hold ourselves accountable for that. Okay. This side of the table, I'm going to have to ask you to be very brief, but Doya, go for it. Yes. Um, to take a look um, at the takeaways from our history, and we speak of the 1918 flu epidemic and Ebola, basically look at all of the actions that were taken there, bring those together. Uh, prepare a regulatory or a protocol that you can uh, start to work on and try to increase communication from government to government so we'll be able to share healthcare information, whether it's genome therapy, whatever's taking place to try to combat the disease or virus. Okay, great. Appreciate the focus on preparedness. Uh, as we look at communities that are, let's say, vulnerable to natural disasters or crisis, I mean, we look at trying to foster that community hub, bringing together, bringing together faith-based organizations, academia, government, small businesses all together. On the other end of the spectrum, we believe that the World Economic Forum is a great platform that brought together post Ebola a great group of the WHO, the World Food Program led by Henry Schein, J&J, &J, and we are all lo loosely together because, again, sustainability Keeping the interest of these institutions is always the challenge. Yeah. Uh, I think, first of all, in major global corporations, you know, when you think about 
even the, um, the regulations there are for how many executives can get on one plane at a time. There are all these succession plans already in place. So what are the plans that the global organizations are having in place in case of such a situation like this? And then I think the thing I'm surprised about, we didn't bring this into this at all, but politics. If this is taking place from October to December 18th, 2019, <laughs> with the debates going on and the presidential election coming up, up in about a year, I think that would play a major part in this kind of scenario. Interesting mm -hmm. point. Martin, quickly. Three points. Use the time that you actually have for preparation. But the best way, set up and maintain information exchange platforms and keep the awareness. It's our responsibility to do this. Thank you. Excellent. Um, for me, my learning was uh, the risk of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, I think it requires a lot more thought and coordination across the stakeholders. And one point, despite the alignment around the room about the importance of some central leadership, I think the challenge in agreeing on the central leadership. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you all. I think uh, summing this up as I see it, investment, planning, preparation, coordinating, prioritization, and obviously all the advanced thought and effort given to those things will hopefully mitigate the effects when the pandemic comes. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jean, and thanks to all of our players for these excellent suggestions. Our plan now is to consider your ideas, uh, the results of today, and come forward with a set of recommendations and a call to action. And we hope that with your experience today, you will continue to be amazing champions for this issue. It's extremely valuable, but very rare, for a group of this diversity to come and spend part of the day talking about these issues. So on behalf of our partners at the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I wanna thank our players again for their participation and insights today. You did an amazing job in a really difficult scenario. And I also like to thank our broader audience here in New York, as well as those participating online. And of course, our amazing center faculty and staff um, and the larger Event 201 team from the Gates Foundation and the World Economic Forum for putting together today's events. So please join us down the hall in the cotillion room for the luncheon, and we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.